MC throws himself on a grenade and gets transmigrated to the world of Boku no Hero Academia with a bare bones but exceptionally powerful system. What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Izuku with System Quirk. Part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Staring at his reflection, a fairly short youth with a rounded face, messy green hair, and matching green eyes muttered, Of all the people I could have reincarnated as, why did it have to be this little squit? Recognizing his reflection as Izuka Midoriya, the main character from a popular anime called My Hero Academia, David, now Izuku, couldn't help exhaling a tired sigh. The goddess of reincarnation had informed him he would be transmigrated into the body of a quirkless human, but he didn't expect it to be the main character. Shaking his head, Izuka muttered, Whatever. Most people don't have a say in the circumstances of their birth, so I shouldn't be groaning about my reincarnation, especially with a perk like this. Staring at the space above his head, Izuka's green eyes blazed with excitement at the words. Izuka Midoriya, Level 3. He hadn't received a sapient system or an omnipotent power like the gamer, but that was intentional. He would rather catch a bullet with his brain than have his life dictated by a bunch of quests. So, when presented with the option, David Naozuku selected a barebone system that allowed him to inspect his status, the status of others, and allocate his attributes freely. Following the information imprinted in his mind, Izuku closed his eyes and muttered, Inspect status! In a faint, nearly inaudible tone. It turned out that human minds were fairly disorderly, so to prevent his status window from appearing and disappearing randomly, Izuka's system was primarily voice activated. He could change this in the system's menu, but elected to leave it as is for the time being. Name: Izuka Midoriya Quirk Digitalization Current Level 3 2933 EXP Effective level, 3, Attributes, Strength, 3, Agility, 3, Vitality, 4, Intelligence, 8, Dexterity, 2, Luck, 10, Free Attributes, 15, Rerolls available, 1, Perks, available when an attribute reaches 50. With the attributes of a normal level 3 averaging around 5, it wasn't an exaggeration to say that Azuko at least prior to David's appropriation, was a fairly weak but intelligent kid. That luck, though, muttered Izuku, a curious smile adorning his face as he briefly considered investing his free attributes into luck. According to the information in his mind, luck didn't affect the probability of favorable events, but the rate at which he acquired experience. Each point granted a stacking 10% experience buff, so if he intended to level quickly, he would need a fairly high luck stat. Fortunately, with each passing month, Izuku would acquire an additional reroll, allowing him to redistribute his attributes as he pleased. In other words, even if he invested all his AP attribute points into luck, he wasn't stuck with his decision for life. Before following through with his initial urge, Izuku focused his mind and analyzed his remaining attributes. Strength corresponded to physical power and durability, while agility affected his maximum speed and his localized friction coefficient. As for vitality and intelligence, the former affected his natural regeneration and bolstered his resistance to abnormal status effects, while the latter influenced his processing speed and ability to retain information. While intelligence was probably one of the best attributes to invest in, it was dexterity that garnered Azuka's interest. He initially thought it would function as it did in the tabletop game Dungeons & Dragons, influencing his finesse and sense of balance. Instead, 
It affected his physical mastery and allowed him to learn various trades and skills more quickly. Not in the literal sense, meaning the skills wouldn't pop up in his status, but he could easily learn martial arts or become proficient in various sports. Though each attribute complements the others, dexterity and luck seem especially useful. If I couldn't redistribute my attributes freely, this would be a difficult decision. Finished with his muttering, Izuku invested 10 of his AP into luck and the rest into intelligence. He was currently a 13-year-old middle school student, so as tantalizing as the other attributes were, they weren't nearly as important as his ability to retain information. More importantly, so long as he worked hard, it was possible to increase his physical attributes with training and exercise. By willfully keeping his strength, agility, and vitality low, Izuku intended to farm as many free attributes as possible between resets. Balling his right hand into a fist, Izuku adopted a confident smile rarely seen on the original's face. He might not be able to acquire one for all, but he was sure he would one day be able to stand at the pinnacle of this world. Where he went from there, he wasn't entirely sure. The only thing he knew for certain was that he had been given a new lease on life, and he intended to make the most of it. Benefiting from the original's memories, Izuku had no major issues settling into his new life. He initially thought being a teen again would be incredibly awkward, but it turned out his worries were for nothing. The original Izuku didn't have many friends due to being quirkless, so he just had to keep his head down and focused on the grind. Fortunately, before throwing himself on a grenade to save several of his friends, Izuku then David was a member of the United States Army's 9th Engineer Battalion. He may not have been the most outstanding member of his battalion, but he still had the experience of enduring basic training and completing two tours of duty. He was used to waking up before dawn for PT physical training, so it wasn't difficult for him to raise his strength and agility to the level of an average middle schooler. Though a handful of people noticed the change in Azuka's physique and mentality, the only person who made a fuss about it was the original so-called best friend, Katsuki Bakugo. The latter had been blessed with a powerful quirk called Explosion, so he reigned over Alder Jr. High as its self-proclaimed king. He and Izuka happened to grow up in the same neighborhood, so the two were intimately familiar with one another. More accurately, Bakugo was Izuka's bully, referring to the latter as Deku and being an indignant piece of crap from the ripe old age of four. Upon learning that Izuku was training, Bakugo intercepted him on one of his morning runs to rant about how useless his efforts were. When Izuka tried to ignore him, Bakugo escalated things by making explosions in the palm of his hand. Doing so caused Izuka's body to tense against his will, but he recovered quickly, surprising the spiky-haired teen by asking what society called people who threatened, exploited, or coerced others using their quirks. It sure as hell wasn't Hero. As someone aspiring to become the number one hero, Bakugo didn't take kindly to the insinuation he was acting like a villain. Unfortunately, Izuku had just reset his attributes a few days prior, so he ended up suffering a bloody nose and a split lip at the hands of his best friend. He thought his previous life's experience with CQC close quarters combat would give him an advantage, but his quirk wasn't the only thing that made Bakugo exceptional. Nen, Ketsuke Bakugo. Quirk, Explosion. Current level, 7. 6,477 EXP. Effective level, 11. Attributes. Strength, 19. Agility, 19. Vitality, 24. Intelligence, 7. Dexterity, 28. Luck, 19. While the average person had approximately 10 attributes per level, Bakugo averaged 16.5. He was also the highest level among his peers even exceeding some adults, so it wasn't difficult to understand why he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Fortunately, while Izuku started below average, possessing only 30 attributes at the threshold of attaining level 4, his free attribute points and ability to increase his attributes through training more than made up for it. He had only leveled twice in 3 months, 
but his effective level at the time of the altercation wasn't too far behind Bakugo's name. Izuka Midoriya Quirk Digitalization Current level 5 for 1401 EXP Effective level 10 Attributes Strength 2 Agility 2 Vitality 22 Intelligence 33 Dexterity 6 Luck 35 Free attributes 0 Rerolls available 1 Perks available when an attribute reaches 50 Had Izuku invested his attributes into strength and agility he would have been able to trounce Bakugo. Instead, he had placed 25 points into both intelligence and luck, while infusing the rest into vitality. The latter had a drastic effect on his stamina and natural recovery, so enhancing it allowed Izuka to train longer and harder. By the end of that month, he was able to increase his strength to 5 and agility to 6, effectively granting himself an additional 11 attributes for free. By descending into Izuka's body at the beginning of his second year in middle school, the current Izuka had 22 months to prepare for the UA high school entrance exam. At an average of 15 points a month, that would bring his total attributes to 360, granting him an effective level of 36. As the average level among pro heroes was only 35, at least in the vicinity of Izuka's house, he should have absolutely no issues passing the exam. What truly concerned Izuku was what he should do about the canon plot. He had only viewed up to season 6 of the anime, but that was more than enough to know crap was going to hit the fan. If he played his cards right, he might be able to prevent the worst of it. Far wiser, however, would be avoiding such perils entirely. Despite throwing himself on a grenade and earning the title of hero in his previous life, Izuku didn't have any attachment to the title. So long as he could support himself and a small family, he didn't really need much else. The issue was that the goddess of reincarnation had given him the body and identity of the protagonist. If he simply avoided the plot, he would be entrusting the fate of the world to a bunch of kids. Mirio might be able to step up, especially if he acquires one for all. But the only guarantees in life were death, taxes, and heartbreak. Fortunately, while Izuku was undecided about his future, Yue was still the number one high school in the country. If he just wanted to keep an eye on things, he could always join the general business or support courses, with a few hundred points distributed between intelligence and dexterity. He could become one of the greatest inventors in the world. He might not enjoy the fame of some heroes, but he would certainly be wealthier. April 1st, 2148 after a full year in his new identity, Izuka was finally presented with an event he recognized. It was the first day of their final year in middle school, and their homeroom teacher was joking about everyone wanting to become heroes. Everyone else was excited by the remark, showing off their quirks in clear violation of the school rules. But Izuku just cracked a knowing smile. Even with 80% of the population possessing quirks, Less than 0.4% had what it takes to become pro-heroes. People were 10 times more likely to become villains, so Izuku couldn't help feeling a little sympathetic toward the majority of his classmates. Fortunately, unlike them, he was more than qualified. He was also ranked 7th among all middle schoolers in the country. So while everyone else was dreaming of possible futures, Izuku closed his eyes and reconfirmed the course he had decided for his own Though he had resolved himself to enroll in Yue's hero course, Izuku decided against trying to meet with All Might during his patrol. Instead, he immediately returned home once school let out, unsurprised to find his mom in the middle of an advanced calisthenics routine in their living room. Seeing him training every day had inspired her to do the same, so despite approaching 40, she didn't look a day over 30. I'm home. Hearing Izuka's voice, a broad smile developed across the face of a young-looking woman with a rounded face, green eyes, and similarly green hair fastened in a ponytail. She was currently in the middle of her routine, but that didn't stop her from bouncing to her feet, smiling even more radiantly as she said, Welcome home, Izuku. What would you like for dinner, sweetheart? 
With his mother, Inko, wearing little more than a white tank top and some black booty shorts, Izuku had to will himself to maintain eye contact as he replied, If it's Kachan's cooking, I could even eat gravel. Cupping her cheeks, Inko issued a cutesy kaya ia before sprinting across the room to give Izuku a sweaty hug as she exclaimed, My Izuku always knows what to say, while actively smothering him, reciting a familiar mantra in his mind. Izuku waited for Inko to release him before stating, It's true though. Kachan's cooking may not be the best in the entire world, but if given the choice between one of your handmade rice balls and a five-star steak, I would choose the rice ball. Oh, Izuku. Though she knew Izuku was merely paying her lip service, Inko couldn't help extending her hand to caress his cheek. He had grown considerably over the past year, both mentally and physically, so she was equal parts proud and lonely. Proud because he was no longer a nervous wreck, and lonely because he no longer depended on her as much. Exhaling a faint sigh, Inko remarked, I wish your father could be here to see the man you're becoming. Furrowing his brows, albeit only for a moment, Izuku forced a smile as he removed Inko's hand from his face and said, Trust me, between the two of us, I'd be the least of Tausen's concerns. Izuku! Understanding the implication of Izuku's words, Inko gave his chest a light smack and added, You shouldn't tease your mother. Now go get washed up. Dinner should be ready in half an hour. Nodding his head, Izuku replied, I'm looking forward to it, before racing up the stairs to his bedroom. It was difficult for him to be around women closer to his mental age, and unlike the original Izuku, he didn't view Inko as just his mother. Things had been simple when she looked like a human potato, but now that she had slimmed down, it was difficult for him not to view her as a woman. It didn't help that she sometimes walked around in little more than her underwear. Suppressing the notion that Inko was trying to seduce him, Izuko flipped on the TV, setting the channel to the local news before opening his laptop to browse the stock market. His bastard of a father had helped him set up a portfolio, so Izuko had been taking advantage of his intellect to ensure he and his mother would never have to depend on a man who abandoned them for a second family overseas. Fortunately, while levels were few and far between, Izuka's intelligence was increasing by at least 10 points each month. He had also stopped investing in luck, at least until he found a reliable source of experience, so his current stat distribution looked like this name. Izuka Midoriya Quirk Digitalization Current Level 10 12,903 EXP Effective Level 19 Attribute Strength 5 Agility 5 Vitality 70 Intelligence 100 Dexterity 18 Luck 10 free attributes, 0 rerolls available, 2 perks, less regeneration, sharp mind, eidetic memory, upon reaching 50 and 100 in the intelligence attribute Izuku, acquired the perks, sharp mind, and eidetic memory. The former improved his focus, while the latter allowed him to recall even the tiniest details of things he had seen, albeit only for a short period. The most important thing was his intelligence attribute itself. Even renowned PhD holders rarely exceeded 70 intelligence, so it wasn't an overstatement to say that Azuka's intellect was among the best in the nation. Taking full advantage of intelligence, along with his burgeoning dexterity, Azuka split his focus between analyzing stock trends and drafting support items. Before investing in stocks, his starting capital had been acquired by modifying and reselling patents to their original owners. He had also filed nearly a dozen of his own, taking advantage of the fact there was no age requirement. So he was currently sitting on savings of 28,255,834 yen, a little over $200,000, a fairly decent, some considering he had only started a few months prior. Diverting Izuka's attention from his laptop and tablet, a breaking news bulletin appeared on the nearby television the headline reading, Japan's number one hero, All Might, appears in Muzutafu, several villains incapacitated in a single blow, seeing no mention of a sludge villain or a certain explosive idiot being taken hostage. A faint smile developed across Izuka's face. 
his memory of the cannon was spotty at best, but there were some things that had stayed with him. Among them was Izuka's first encounter with All Might. Because of the original Izuka's desire for validation, he ended up clinging to All Might even when the latter attempted to flee. This not only led to Izuka learning All Might's secret, but it also distracted the hero from his original task, turning over a dangerous villain to the police. Instead, as a direct result of Izuka's action, the villain was able to escape and take his beloved Kaken hostage. With Izuka choosing to return home immediately after school let out, the circumstances leading to Bakugo becoming a hostage never transpired. Instead, All Might defeated the villain with ease before turning him over to the police. This was a perfect example of how little changes could have a drastic influence on the fates of various people. So Izuka made a quick note of the incident in his journal before returning his attention to far more important matters. He had invested in several locally traded businesses in anticipation of All Might's arrival, so he was looking forward to seeing how their values skyrocketed in the coming months. August 19th, 2148. Though he would normally be outside training, taking full advantage of his summer break, Izuka's plans were delayed by Inko asking if he could help alleviate the tension in her shoulders. He initially didn't think much of the request, as it wasn't the first time Inko had petitioned him for a massage, but it became apparent today was different when she suggested it might be easier to move if he sat behind her, effectively inviting him to straddle her legs as she lay face down atop a yoga mat. Suppressing his initial shock, Izuka briefly considered whether or not Inko was testing him before ultimately abiding by her suggestion. He had long since suspected that Inko was coming onto him, but he had disregarded it as a delusion. Now, even if this was just Inko's attempt to try and confirm something, he felt compelled to play along. Fortunately, while Inko's perky behinds possessed an almost irresistible allure, Izuka managed to stay focused on his task without exacerbating matters even further. There were several instances where his bulge made contact with Inko's intergluteal cleft, but his sausage never once stood proud. He really, really wanted to, but even if Izuku viewed Inko as a woman, it didn't change the fact she was his current body's mother. He was willing to do just about anything to make her happy, but there were some lines that shouldn't be crossed, breaking a long and tense silence. Izuku retracted his hands from Inko's back, wiping the sweat from his brow as he asked, How is it? Are you still feeling sore anywhere? Instead of responding to Izuka's inquiry with words, Inko looked back at him with a sidelong gaze, staring at him for several seconds with what he could best describe as an accusatory look. It was apparent she expected something more, but with Izuku simply smiling back at her, she eventually exhaled an audibly heated sigh and answered, I'm still feeling a little sore around certain areas, but I can deal with those myself. Suppressing the fire in his heart, Izuku supplied a curt nod before rising to his feet and extending his hand to help Inko rise. She initially stared at it with an absent-minded look, but eventually accepted it with a wry smile remarking, I'm such an idiot, in a self-deprecating tone, pulling Inko to her feet. Izuku surprised her with a hug, squeezing her tightly as he asserted, You're a beautiful and amazing woman, Kachan. If I weren't your son, I wouldn't have hesitated. Not even for a moment. Though Izuka's words did little to quell the shame she was experiencing, Inko would be lying if she said they didn't help at all. She would probably spend the rest of her life regretting today's events, but she could endure knowing Izuka didn't hate her. The hands feeling her jiat made that very clear. In the wake of his fated encounter with Inko, Izuka found himself staring at his bedroom ceiling with a listless look on his face. He didn't regret what he had done, but with the benefit of hindsight, he realized he had unnecessarily complicated things by agreeing to Inko's proposition. Had he been thinking clearly at the time, he would have teased her or made a joke to remind her they were mother and son. Raising his hand toward nothing in particular, Izuku stared at the gaps between his fingers as he droned, I really need to get myself a girlfriend. These teenage hormones are making me behave like an idiot. 
Though his actions couldn't be explained by the mere onset of puberty, Izuku would be remiss to disregard its influence entirely. The rest could be credited to his previous life. He enjoyed a fairly active nightlife before his deployment, so going a full year without getting a sausage what left him feeling more than a little pent up. Unfortunately for Izuku, most of the women he was interested in were between 10 and 20 years as senior. There were some fairly cute girls in his class, several of which had approached him, but they were all middle schoolers. Izuku may have been a middle schooler himself, but he had the mentality and preferences of an adult. If someone like Bakugo's mom had attempted the same thing as Inko, he would have plowed the explosive temperament out of her. Exhaling a sigh, Izuku dropped his hand and closed his eyes, the images of several canon figures appearing in his mind. The woman he would most like to get his hands on was Mirko. She was a bit of a short stack, but her physique and temperament were amazing. Unfortunately, like most of the women who appeared in Azuka's mind, Mirko was much older than he was. Even if he approached her earnestly, she would probably laugh him off and call him cute. Thus, with few other options, Izuku began perusing the girls at the back of his list, a visual library of the girls he was bound to meet if he attended UA High School. One in particular had always stood out. Her appearance was one reason, but it was her quirk that truly set her apart. It may not be the best suited for combat, but anyone that could eat a tub of ice cream and convert it to literal gold was worthy of Izuka's interest. Feeling a little tired after his workout, Izuku was relaxing on a park bench when a familiar sight entered his view. Shortly after their little altercation, Bakugo signed up at a local gym and began running the same route as Izuku. The latter never asked him why, but that didn't stop Bakugo from confronting and telling him that he would always be stronger and faster. After all, he was going to be the number one hero. Stopping near Izuku, Bakugo sneered as he asked, Taking another break, loser? If you're not going to take this seriously, you should just quit. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, No, I don't think I will. Before taking a sip from his camelback's mouthpiece, he had gotten used to wearing them in his previous life, and it was a hell of a lot more convenient than walking around with a water bottle. TCH clicking his tongue, Bakugo looked like he had more to say, but turned away and started running. As for Izuku, he enjoyed his break for a few minutes longer before resuming his own run. February 25th, 2149, with the UA entrance exam taking place the following day, Izuku found himself staring listlessly at his status screen. Name, Izuka Midoriya. Quirk, Digitalization, Current Level, 15, 42,219 EXP, Effective Level, 32, Attributes Strength, 7, Agility, 7, Vitality, 100. Intelligence, 100. Dexterity, 100. Lock, 10. Free attributes, 0. Rerolls available. 2. Perks, less regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, eidetic memory, nimble fingers, keen senses. Though he was roughly 30 points behind where he expected to be, Izuka was fairly satisfied with his stats. The healthy body and keen senses parks, in particular, were amazing. The former allowed him to always feel refreshed, while the latter enhanced each of his five senses, particularly his sight and hearing. The issue Izuku was currently facing was that he wasn't sure whether to redistribute his stats or keep them as they were. Others might not know what the entrance exam entailed, but unless something had changed, he knew they would be tasked with defeating various robots. Doing so would reward them villain points based on the robot's difficulty, with the top 36 scorers being chosen for the hero course. What the examiners wouldn't mention was that participants could also acquire points by saving or providing assistance to others. Selflessness was one of the defining features of a pro hero, so providing aid to others would reward participants with rescue points. With his current physical attributes, Izuka doubted he could defeat even the weakest villain bot. If he focused on helping people, however, there was a good chance he could pass without needing to. The only problem was that 
The UA entrance exam was just the beginning. Once he became a student, Izuku would be expected to participate in combat and rescue training, exercises that would require skillful use of one's quirk or a strong physique. Though it was easy to distribute some of his attributes into strength and agility, doing so would make it much harder for Izuku to acquire bonus attributes. His system allowed him to break through the natural limits of humans, but growing beyond that with training was difficult. The higher an attribute was, the more difficult it was to elevate it further. Thus, if he wanted to perform well in class, Izuku would need to abandon his current method of acquiring attribute points. Shaking his head, Izuku activated the reroll function as he muttered, Whatever. I'll just use this as an opportunity to experiment and stockpile rerolls. Though it was called rerolling, Izuka's attributes didn't immediately reset to one. Instead, plus and minus signs appeared next to each attribute, along with a check mark and X near the bottom. So long as he didn't confirm a selection, he could redistribute his attributes as he pleased. Name: Izuka Midoriya. Quirk: Digitalization. Current level: 15. 42,219 exp. Effective level, 32. Attribute strength, 50. Agility, 50. Vitality, 100. Intelligence, 62. Dexterity, 50. Luck, 10. Free attributes, 0. Rerolls available, 1. Perks, bronze skin, fleet footed, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, nimble fingers. Satisfied with his distribution, Izuku confirmed his selection, his body experiencing a rush similar to adrenaline. Unfortunately, while he felt like he could take a truck head-on, the decreases in intelligence, combined with his loss of keen senses, made him feel sluggish. It was similar to the buzz one would get after consuming strong alcohol, but significantly less pleasant. So this is what it's like to be as dumb as a PhD holder, muttered Izuku, an amused smile developing across his face. Then, after a moment of deliberation, he rose from his desk and picked up the heaviest dumbbells he currently owned. With six to seven strength, 20 kilograms was very near the max he could curl with one hand. Now, while it didn't exactly feel weightless, he had no trouble lifting it at all. Setting aside the dumbbell, Izuku moved over to his curl bar, currently outfitted with 50 kilograms of weight. This was close to his body weight, but he only had to exert a little to raise and curl it with one arm. Raising and lowering the bar with little difficulty, Izuku remarked, Wow, this is even better than I imagined. If Bakugo saw this, he'd have a brain aneurysm. Though he had once calculated each point to be equivalent to 5 kilograms of lifting power, the most strength Izuku had ever possessed was 10. Now that he had 50, he should be able to deadlift approximately 250 kilograms. Far from superhuman, but incredible for a 14-year-old. Returning the curl bar to its usual resting place, Izuku made his way over to his desk, retrieving an X-Acto knife from one of the drawers. According to the information in his mind, the bronze skin perk did exactly what one might expect, making his skin as hard as bronze. To test this, Izuka traced the X-Acto knife across the back of his forearm, his green eyes glistening with curiosity as wherever he traced the blade, his skin gained a reflective bronze hue. Setting aside the X-Acto knife, Izuku pinched his forearm as hard as he could. Nothing happened at first, but the more pressure he put into his fingers, the more prominent the bronze hue. If anyone else were present, they would naturally assume it was the byproduct of a quirk that allowed him to convert his body to bronze. That could be a minor issue, but Izuku didn't believe the teachers or staff of UA would make a big deal out of it. If push came to shove, he would just feign ignorance until they made him take a quirk evaluation test. Having confirmed his strength and durability, Izuku still had one thing to test before calling it a day. Like strength, the most agility he had ever had was 10. Now that it was 50, Izuku approximated his maximum speed to be around 33 meters per second, 
roughly 120 km per hour. Compared to his strength, this was easily superhuman, standing outside a fortress-like gate. Various thoughts crossed Azuka's mind as he stared up at the four interconnected skyscrapers that formed the main building of UA. Those partaking in the entrance exam had been asked to gather in one of the assembly halls for an explanation, but Izuku wasn't in a hurry to enter. Instead, he was using his ability to inspect the status of others, specifically those he recognized. Spotting a familiar girl with bobbed brown hair, large brown eyes, and tiny blush marks on her face, Izuku immediately inspected her status. Name. Achiko Yurarika. Quirk. Zero gravity. Current level 10. 11,246 CXP. Effective level 15. Attribute strength 14. Agility 12. Vitality 28. Intelligence 35. Dexterity 24. Luck 46. Not too bad, though, Izuku. Her level wasn't very high but she was about as strong as an average adult. With her inordinately high luck stat, she would grow much faster than most people. In other words, she had a lot of latent potential. Noticing Izuka's gaze, Yurarika, wearing a thick coat and scarf due to the wintry temperature, gave him an awkward but friendly smile as she said, Hello there. Are you also here to take the entrance exam? We can go in together if you'd like. As Izuku was standing right in front of the entrance, Yurarka thought he might be nervous about stepping inside. She was also feeling anxious, so she thought it might make things easier for both of them if they entered together. Catching Yurarka a little off guard, Izuku shook his head, calmly replying, I'm not nervous. I was gathering information on the competition. To that end, you seem like a strong competitor. Might I ask your name? Extending his hand, Izuko added, Mine is Izuka Midoriya. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Recovering from her brief stupor, Yurarka accepted Izuka's hand, smiling awkwardly as she replied, It's nice to meet you, Midoriya Kuen. My name is Achiko Yurarika. I wish us both the best of luck in the exam. Nodding in affirmation, Izuko offered a curt likewise before releasing Yurarika's hand and letting her walk away. It was clear their interaction had intimidated her somewhat, so he didn't attempt to keep her longer than necessary. Instead, he spent a few more minutes observing other students before making his way inside. With more than a thousand students filling the auditorium, Izuka didn't attempt to search for his future classmates. Instead, he waited for the person who would be explaining the exam to appear, a famous pro hero with blonde hair reminiscent of a cockatiel's crown, triangular sunglasses, a leather outfit, and a series of speakers around his neck. Name, Hizashi Yamada. Quirk, voice. Current level, 37. 701, 8448 EXP. Effective level, 40. Attributes strength, 52. Agility, 29. Vitality, 130. Intelligence, 78. Dexterity, 59. Luck, 54. Seeing the man's present mixed stats, Izuka couldn't help thinking, what is he a cockroach? It was perfectly normal for most pro heroes to have high vitality, making them exceptionally tenacious, but 130 was ridiculous. It wasn't the highest he had observed, but most of them possessed some form of physical mutation or body enhancement quirk. Interrupting Izuka's thoughts, the wannabe cockatiel shouted, Yeah, at the top of his voice, amplified by his quirk. This was yet another reason Izuku had taken his time to enter, as everyone sitting near the front of the auditorium had to cover their ears like a bunch of idiots standing near the speakers at a concert. As expected, both the exam and the rules matched Izuka's memory from his previous life. After changing into clothes that were easier to move in, each examinee was asked to report to one of five exam sites, Mock City's roughly five by five city blocks in size. Their goal was to destroy as many villain robots as possible before time ran out. To make things interesting, there was also a zero-point robot 
that examinees could fight, but were advised to avoid. As for what made it different from the other robots, well, it was the size of a building. Unlike his counterpart in the anime, Izuka had no intention of confronting the Zero Pointer. Instead, he planned to take out some of the weaker robots before spending the remainder of the exam helping others. He might play hero if Yuraka tripped as she did in the anime, but Izuka doubted things would play out the same way. After all, even random words spoken during a conversation could have a drastic impact on the flow of fate. Setting aside his wayward thoughts, Izuku surprised several students by opening the armored suitcase he had been carrying around. Present Mike had stated they were allowed to bring along whatever they wanted, so he intended to make use of the support tool he had prepared in advance. Is that... is that a sword? asked a wide-eyed, incredibly confused girl with drill-like horns sticking out of her head. Hearing the drill-horned girl's question, Izuka's green eyes flashed as he answered. Indeed. The main body is composed of a special high-density metal, making it even more resilient than tungsten carbide. Better yet, the blade's interior is filled with a spongy, lightweight material that's excellent at absorbing and scattering shockwaves. The length and weight make it a little difficult to use, but it's ideal for an exam like this. Not expecting Izuku to suddenly start listing out the specs of his sword, the drill horned girl, alongside several other students, had a stunned look on her face. Their reactions caused the smile on Izuku's to cramp, but he recovered quickly, extracting the 110 centimeters long sword from its case. It was modeled after the weapon of a character named Kame, someone that had left a deep impression on Izuku in his previous life, so the primarily black blade was much broader and thicker than the average sword. Is that even allowed? asked a fairly tall, serious-looking youth with neatly combed blue hair and square frame glasses. Izuku immediately recognized him as one of his future classmates, Tenya Aida, so he took a glimpse at his status while replying, Why wouldn't it be? The handout we were given said support items were permitted. Name, Tenya Aida. Quirk Engine. Current Level, 21. 115,006 EXP. Effective Level, 32. Attributes Strength, 37. Agility, 76. Vitality, 44. Intelligence, 57. Dexterity, 63. Luck, 41. Pushing up his glasses, Ida retorted, a sword can hardly be called a support item. Shouldering his weapon, Izuku replied, Your opinion has been noted. Also, good luck during the exam. Frowning slightly, Ida looked like he had more to say, but changed his mind when present Mike abruptly shouted and began from his perch atop a tower-like observation platform. While most people were still confused by the sudden announcement, Izuku had been waiting for it since the start. Thus, while most of the examinees were standing around like confused mannequins, he bolted into the faux city in search of villain bots. Bursting forth from one of the buildings, a robot that looked like a souped-up version of Wally charged at Izuko, its right arm fitted with a Gatling gun, while its left had a vice-like gripper. The former only fired paintballs, but you would lose points if you got struck by them and didn't possess a quirk that enhanced your durability. As the aforementioned robot was merely a one-pointer, Izuku threw caution to the wind and charged directly at it. He wasn't sure his attack would be able to rip through the robot's metallic plating and joints, but that wasn't going to stop him from trying. Slipping past the robot on its left side, opposite the Gatling gun, Izuku mustered all his strength to aim at the automaton's vertebrae-like neck. The latter was an intentional design flaw, so not only did Izuka's sword slice through it, but the robot's entire body crumbled. Looking back at the robot's remains, Izuku blinked several times as he thought, Seriously? What is it made out of Legos? Unfortunately, while his ability to inspect a target status even applied to animals, Izuku couldn't see the one-pointer stats. He also didn't have time to stand around dawdling, so he ignored the nearby one-pointers, and made his way toward the city center. He suspected that the higher value robots 
could be found there. So he planned to harvest at least 50 points before shifting his focus to helping people. With the average examinee possessing between 10 to 15 agility, Izuku was among the first to reach the city center. There, he found a large group of one-pointers acting as foot soldiers for five two-pointers and a single three-pointer. Their numbers were fairly intimidating, but Izuku only hesitated for a brief moment before charging directly at them. Doing so got him peppered with literally hundreds of paintball rounds, but he was confident the examiners would notice his bronze skin and not dock him any points. After breaking through the blockade of one-pointers by slicing through two of their necks, Izuka leaped at the nearest two-pointer, a quadrupedal robot with a sleek body and a scorpion-like tail. It appeared to be far more agile than the one-pointers, but its movements were limited due to the proximity of other robots. Diving under the two-pointer's tail, Izuku stabbed his sword deep into the automaton's exposed core. Grease, oil, and what Izuku presumed to be hydraulic fluid burst out of it. But Izuku managed to pull away before it could get onto his face or eyes. Just as Izuku was about to attack his second two-pointer, a heavy force stuck him in the side. He didn't suffer any serious injuries, but he let go of his sword and was knocked off balance by a two-pointer that had attacked from his blind spot. Shit, hissed Izuku, bounding to his feet without trying to recover his sword. In hindsight, charging into a large group of enemies alone wasn't the smartest decision he could have made. However, as this was his first time participating in this type of battle, he didn't have any experiences to draw from. In his previous world, battle typically meant hunkering down and firing at enemies from cover. Clashing against a group of robots with a sword wasn't exactly taught in BCT, basic combat training. Before Izuku could consider his next course of action, a high-pressured but strangely tempered wave of steam washed over him, the result of a missile fired by the three-pointer. The latter was designed like a tank with a series of rocket launchers on its shoulders, but instead of exploding into a ball of heat and death, it erupted into a cloud of rapidly expanding foam that would entrap anyone unfortunate to get caught in the blast radius. Holy heel, screamed Izuku, albeit only within his mind. Getting trapped within the foam meant disqualification, so he must all his strength to break free before it could fully condense. Emerging from the foam right in front of the three-pointer, the depths of Izuku's green eyes emitted a faint glow as he grit his teeth and punched the tanky machine directly in its chassis. Fortunately, while the material resembled reinforced metal plating, its toughness was more like plastic that had been shattered and glued back together. Izuka's entire forearm turned bronze due to the counterforces exerted on it, but he managed to cave in what approximated the three-pointer's chest cavity. Refusing to make the same mistake a third time, Izuka didn't stop to revel in his accomplishment. There were still four two-pointers and at least fifteen one-pointers present. He couldn't allow them to encircle and attack him from his blind spots, so he leaped over the remains of the three-pointer and made a beeline for the nearest building, observing Izuku and the other students from a control room filled with monitors. The principal of UA, a man resembling the combination of a cat, a dog, and a bear with white fur, mused, My, it would appear we've got a reckless one on our hands. Charging into a large group of enemies all by himself? Not what I expected from one of the top students in the nation. Responding to the principal's Nizu's words, an incredibly lanky man with skeletal features and prominent bangs framing his face remarked, He's a fiery one, that's for sure. But isn't he the quirkless that was mentioned in the briefing? If that's the case, how do you explain his speed? He's nearly as fast as that boy with engines in his legs. I'm curious about that as well, replied Nizu pulling up Azuka's file as he spoke. The latter had garnered significant attention as the first quirkless student to apply to the hero course, so each of the teachers present was at least vaguely aware of his circumstances. Though he had memorized the files of every single applicant, Niza felt inclined to read out, Izuka Midoriya, 14 years old, blood type. 
Oh. He was diagnosed as quirkless at the age of four and demonstrated no obvious signs of a late stage awakening throughout elementary or middle school. There is mention of him starting to exercise around his 13th birthday, but his most recent physical fitness test indicated he was fairly average among his peers. In terms of academics, however, his scores are off the charts. As Mizu read off Zuka's information, the Skeletal Man, better known as the number one hero, All Might, couldn't help frowning as he balled his hands into fists. There were cases of people awakening their quirks during puberty, but Izuka's file told a different story. It was almost like he had received a quirk from someone else. Seeing through All Might's thoughts, Nizu adopted an assuring tone as he said, Now, now, let's not jump to any conclusions. I'm certain there's a perfectly logical explanation for the disparity between Midoriyakuen's file and his current performance. Once the exam has concluded, we will invite him for an interview. Would you like to participate? Maintaining a grim countenance, All Might nodded in affirmation, but kept his eyes fixed on Izuku. His expression gave the impression he was angry, but while that was certainly the case, the glimmer in his eyes was one of conviction, not hate. If his suspicions proved true, he would do everything in his power to ensure Izuku could break free from the influence that had taken hold of him. That was his duty as both the number one hero and a teacher. Unaware of the attention his actions had garnered, Izuka took advantage of the urban setting to conceal himself and eliminate villain bots along the periphery. Fortunately, about five minutes into the exam, other examinees began to arrive. Once it was no longer 20 against 1, he had a much easier time dealing with the villain bots. Thanks to that, he managed to acquire 38 points by the time a nearby building collapsed, the result of a colossal 60M treaded robot rising from beneath its foundation. Though he had known the zero pointer would be big, the sight of it caused Izuka's body to do tense against his will. It didn't have any weapons like the other villain bots, but its size allowed it to move through and topple over buildings as if they were made of glass. It had a few notable weak points, but he would need to leap onto it from above to reach them. Voicing Izuka's thoughts aloud, a nearby examinee exclaimed, How the hell are we supposed to beat that thing? Prompting another to respond, Just run away, you idiot! Seemingly prompted by the second voice, the examinees gathered near the city center began to flee as fast as their feet could. One of the fastest was Ida, who, upon noticing Izuku, briefly looked his way before running past. Feeling the wind pressure from Ida's sprint smack him in the face, Izuku couldn't help thinking he had experienced this before. He was almost certain something similar had transpired in the anime. Fortunately, while the original Izuku had been immobilized by fear, the transmigrated David was relatively calm. It was true that he had frozen up, but only for a brief moment. Thus, when Ida looked over, it wasn't fear he had seen on Izuka's face. It was curiosity. With the Zero Pointer using massive tank treads to get around, there was a gap nearly three meters tall beneath its chassis. If Izuku could get under and then behind it, he may be able to climb onto its back. The risks were many, but one of the reasons the examiners waited until the last minute to release it was because it was programmed to not attack students. After all, if someone died during a mere entrance exam, Yue's reputation would plummet. Confident of his assertions, Izuku waited until the Zero Pointer turned its upper body to attack a building before rushing at it. The previous night, he had been able to cover 50M and 100M in just under 4 and 6 seconds. His maximum speed should be around 33 meters per second, but he couldn't confirm it since a local policeman saw how fast he was running and warned him not to use his quirk in public. Though the ruined terrain slowed him down a bit, Izuku reached the base of the Zero Pointer in around 7 seconds. He failed to factor in the time it would take him to decrease his momentum, but it ultimately didn't matter as the Zero Pointer was designed to be exceptionally slow. Even with treads that allowed it to turn in place, it took several seconds to do so. By then, 
Izuku was already on its back, climbing up its multi-segmented spine with an adrenaline-fueled grin on his face. 30 seconds remaining, shouted Present Mike, but Izuka didn't hear him. All he could hear were his heartbeat, pounding in his ears, and the sound of the destruction wrought by the Zero Pointer. Unfortunately, while he was able to reach the top of the giant robot, that was the extent of Izuka's planning. The Zero Pointer had several obvious weak spots, but he lacked the power to take advantage of them. So this is my current limit, thought Izuku, gasping even in his mind. He guesstimated it would take at least 500 strength for his punches to have any meaningful effect on the Zero Pointer's legitimate armored plating. He could reach that in about two and a half years with his current training method, but it would require him to remain weak and avoid trouble at all costs. With the Zero Pointer abruptly shutting down, Izuku blinked to awareness, just in time to hear Present Mike shouting. And that's it, ladies and gents. This year's UA High Entrance Exam has officially come to a close. I hope everyone did their best, because it's too late for regrets now. Ha. Plopping onto his bottom, and subsequently lying atop the Zero Pointer's head, Izuku closed his eyes and silently lamented that he hadn't been transmigrated a few years earlier. Sure, growing up and going through elementary school would have been a pain in the ass, but if he had a full 10 years to prepare, his status would be at least five times what it was now. Fortunately, while he was more than a little dissatisfied with the outcome of the entrance exam, Izuka knew it was only a matter of time before he surpassed the majority of his peers. He might not be able to top the hero billboard chart, but that was never his goal. He only enrolled in the hero course, because there was a certain little girl he felt compelled to save at all costs. While most of the examinees quickly left the mock city after the entrance exam, Izuku had a grim countenance as he dug through the rubble at the city center. The sword he brought with him might not appear expensive at a glance, but acquiring the materials and manufacturing it cost more than 15 million yen. He had more than enough savings to commission a new one, but he was currently saving up to purchase a decently sized house and a plot of land in the countryside. Interrupting Izuku's search, the familiar, somewhat timid sounding voice of Yurarka called out to him saying, Excuse me, Midoriya Kuin, could this be what you're searching for? Rising to his feet and turning in a single motion, Izuku's round green eyes glistened when he saw the sword in Yurarka's hands. The previously grim look on his face was nowhere to be seen. Instead, an uncontainable smile developed across his face as he answered, We meet again, Yurarika-san. And yes, that is exactly what I was searching for. Did you pick it up during the exam? Smiling bashfully, Yurarka proffered the sword to Izuku as she replied, Sorry if there are any scratches on it. I found it lying on the ground, so I picked it up and tried using it. It made taking out the robots a lot easier, he... Without bothering to inspect the blade, Izuka's smile broadened as he said, I'm glad to hear that. And don't worry. By returning it to me, you've done me a tremendous service and saved me a ton of money. If you need my help, don't hesitate to ask. I'm someone who always repays his debts. Chuckling nervously, Yurarika waved her hands as she replied, There's no need for that. I mean, it's just one sword. How much could it have cost? Shaking his head, Izuku didn't hesitate to reveal, Don't be so quick to judge. If sold for its material value alone, the price of this sword would easily exceed 13 million yen. Hearing Izuku's words, the previously bashful smile on Yurarika's face cramped. She was one of the many individuals who sought to become a hero for financial stability. So Izuku mentioning his sword's worth caused her brain to short circuit. It wasn't a ludicrous amount, but it was enough to purchase one of the more economical sports cars. Amused by Yurarika's reaction, Izuku shouldered his sword and asked, What's wrong? Are you regretting giving it back to me? In a joking tone. Regaining her senses, Yurarika shook her head and waved her hands as she stammered, T, that isn't the case. I, I was just... Unable to come up with an excuse, Yurarika's words gradually trailed off, 
her brown eyes meeting Azuka's for several seconds before she abruptly turned around and ran away at her maximum speed, shouting, This is all just a misunderstanding, as she went. Though he had gotten accustomed to the people of this world behaving differently than those of his previous life, Izuku was still caught off guard by Urarika's escape. Her behavior exuded a certain charm, but he would be lying if he didn't say her response was a little over the top. Shaking his head, Izuku waited for Urarika to cover a fair distance before heading in the same direction. The results of the entrance exam wouldn't be published until next week. If he were accepted, the UA academic term would begin on April 1st. That left Izuku with a little more than five weeks to prepare and, most importantly, adapt to his present capabilities. Interrupting Izuku's plans, present Mike stopped him as he attempted to leave, singing, Yo, 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 are you Izuku Midoriya Quinn? Mind coming with me for a moment? while performing a strange walking dance routine. Though he was very tempted to refuse, Izuka nodded and replied, Yes, I'm Izuka Midoriya. Might I ask what you need me for? Striking a pose, Present Mike pointed toward Izuku as he responded with an amplified, Yeah, yeah. Then, in a far more normal tone, he explained, The principal wants to talk with you. It's nothing serious, but he noticed some irregularities during your entrance exam. He needs to ask you some questions to fairly evaluate your results. As he anticipated something like this occurring, Izuku wasn't surprised by present mixed words. It was a bit sooner than he expected, but he nodded a second time, replying, Sure. My Kachan isn't expecting me home until later this afternoon, so I've got time. Striking another pose, present Mike exclaimed, Right on! Before leading the way to the principal's office, a well-lit room that provided an overview of the entire campus from one of UA's central towers. There, Izuka came face to face with the infamous mascot of My Hero Academia, one of the few animals that had awakened a quirk. Name. Subject 301. Quirk. High spec. Current level. 8. 7004 EXP. Effective level. 82. Attributes Strength, 2. Agility, 17. Vitality, 33. Intelligence, 549. Dexterity, 41. Luck, 183. Though he was surprised by Niza's status, particularly his intelligence, the little white mouse bear thing wasn't the only one in the room. There was a very familiar, exceptionally muscular man standing off to the side, his trademark smile and rabbit-like hair recognizable to people around the globe. Name. Tashinori Yagi. Quirk. Transfer. Stockpiling. Singularity. Gear shift. Sealed. F.A. Gene. Sealed. Danger Sense. Sealed. Black Whip. Sealed. Smoke Screen. Sealed. Float. Sealed. Current level. 20,108. 1 trillion 94 billion 500 and 63 million 900 and 94,217 EXP. Effective level, 60,563. Attribute strength, 219,703. Agility, 54,256. Vitality, 299,492. Intelligence, 69. Dexterity, 32,008. Luck, 108. Holy freaking shit, thought Izuku, his body tensing and eyes becoming as round as saucers. Before now, the highest level he had seen was 1,508, belonging to Empty Lady in her giant form. He knew Tashinori, better known as All Might, had to be stronger, but what kind of ridiculous shit was level 60,563? As he was used to people being starstruck by his presence, Izuku's slack-jawed response didn't trigger any red flags in All Might's mind. Instead, he made a thumbs-up pose and said, Greetings, Midoriya Shonen. I had the opportunity to witness your performance in the entrance exam. Some of your actions were a little reckless, but I see the makings of a true hero in you. Keep it up! Recovering from his stupor, Izuku forced a smile as he replied, Thanks. That means a lot coming from Japan's number one hero. 
I promise to do my best to meet your expectations. With his original self being one of All Might's biggest fans, Izuku wasn't insincere when he said he wanted to match up to All Might's expectations. The man wasn't without flaws, but there was a reason he was the symbol of peace and one of the most memorable goats in anime. Nodding in approval, Nizu inserted himself into the discussion by saying, I also have high hopes for your future, Midoriya Koen. That's why I called you here on such short notice. Nothing is official just yet, but your efforts earned you more than enough points to qualify for the hero course. There are just a few things we need to make certain of before you can become a student at UA. Standing a little straighter, a genuine smile developed across Izuka's face as he asserted, So long as they don't pry into my personal or private life, I would be happy to answer your questions. Principal Nizu, nodding a second time, Niza said, I understand. However, as most of my questions are related to your capabilities, I'm afraid they will infringe on your privacy a bit. The association has entrusted us with the heavy responsibility of preparing the next generation of heroes, so we need to know what you're capable of if we're to guide you properly. Supplying a nod of his own, Izuka replied, Fair enough. I'm assuming this is related to my quirk. Adopting a strangely human smile, Nizu answered, Indeed. According to your medical and academic records, you should be quirkless. I'm curious to know when you awakened one, and, more importantly, why you elected to keep it a secret. Matching Nizu's expression, Izuku rebutted, To be fair, I did inform my mother, and now that you're the one who's asking, I'm planning to inform you as well. As for why I didn't tell anyone else, it's due to the nature of my quirk. Based on my research, there hasn't been anything like it in the history of quirks. I was afraid that if word got out, my Kachan would be pressured into enlisting me in a quirk study program. She was enduring a lot of stress at the time, and I didn't wish to make things worse. Hanging his head slightly, Niza muttered, I see in a faint tone. He was well aware of the double life Izuka's father lived, so he couldn't blame the former for being cautious, especially if his quirk was as unique as he said it was. After waiting several seconds, Nizu raised his head, regaining his smile as he said, You're a very considerate boy. Now that you've mentioned it, however, I can't help feeling curious about the nature of your quirk. Will you share it with us? Nodding his head, Izuku replied, Of course. The two of you are among the most respected people in all of Japan. I believe that, even if I tell you everything, you won't expose my abilities to the public. You have my word, replied Nizu, his expression conveying a sincerity rarely found in humans. He knew what it was like to be experimented on and studied, so he would never allow his students to suffer a similar fate. Though it was unnecessary, all Might followed Niza's words by stating, As a hero, it is my sworn duty to protect the people within my reach. I promise you, Izuku Midoriya, no matter what happens, I will not allow any harm to befall you. Feeling All Might's charisma crash into him like a pressure wave, Izuku was momentarily stunned. He had heard heartfelt claims before, but this was the first time he could feel the weight of someone's promise. It was a strange but reassuring feeling. Thus, after a long moment of silence, he adopted a serious expression and began his account, stating, It all began two years ago when I looked into my bathroom mirror. After listening to Izuka's explanation, including the parts about him being able to see other people's statuses and revise his attributes, Niza's eyes glistened with curiosity. I can see why you kept your power a secret, said Nizu. Even if it were just the power to ascertain a person's identity, your quirk is remarkable. The power to quantify a person's attributes and freely allocate your own is simply outstanding. Unable to restrain his curiosity, Nizu couldn't help asking, Do you mind apprising me of my attributes? Piggybacking off of Nizu's words, All Might's tone was markedly more serious as he said, If it isn't too much of an inconvenience, I'd like you to do the same for me. 
Nodding his head, Izuko asked, Mind lending me a piece of paper? It would be a lot easier to write them down. Happily assenting to Izuku's request, Nizu watched with intrigue as the former wrote down his information. Both his and All Might's bodies tensed when Izuku wrote their names as Subject 301 and Tashinori Yagi, but they recovered quickly. Staring at his status sheet with interest, Nizu mused, So this is how the world quantifies my intelligence. How fascinating. Agreeing with Nizu's statement, All Might gave a curt nod and muttered, It really is an incredible quirk. While staring intently at the quirk Suzuku had written for him, shifting his attention to All Might's status sheet, Nizu's smile broadened as he noted, As impressive as my intelligence is, your attributes are truly remarkable, All Might. Seeing your strength and vitality, I think it's safe to say you aren't just the number one hero in Japan, but the entire world. Restraining the urge to laugh, All Might adopted his trademark smile as he replied, You honor me with your words, sir. Then, shifting his steely blue eyes to Izuku, he added, As for you, young Midoriya, there's something I would like to ask. With your power, it would be a simple matter to secure your place as one of the top intellectuals in the entire world. Tell me, why did you choose to become a hero? Having long prepared for such a question, Izuku didn't hesitate to answer, because the world needs heroes, in a firm tone. His true reasons were a little more complicated, but that didn't affect the sincerity of his response. He wouldn't have joined the army, or leaped onto a grenade, if he lacked a spirit of self-sacrifice. Seeing the conviction in Izuka's clear green eyes, All Might's abruptly flashed. If there were any doubts in his heart about Izuku being a spy, he was now certain that wasn't the case. Not only would his former nemesis never relinquish such a powerful quirk, but Izuka's mentality was through and through that of a hero. Placing his hands on Izuka's shoulders, All Might left the former feeling speechless as he reaffirmed, You're going to make an exceptional hero, Izuku Midoriya. I guarantee it. Though the intensity of All Might's statement gave him delusions of being chosen as his successor, Izuku, unfortunately, couldn't broach the subject on his own. He also believed in his quirk and its ability to facilitate endless growth. So once he recovered, he adopted a gratified smile and replied, I won't let you down, with confidence. After returning home and greeting his mother, who now walked around in far more conservative clothing, Izuku retired to his room and immediately plunged face-first onto his bed. He hadn't intended to expose himself this early, but now that he had, it felt like a tremendous weight had been lifted from his shoulders. I wonder if this is a byproduct of the original's obsession, thought Izuku, slowly turning himself over to stare at the ceiling. One of the very first things he did after transmigrating was store away the original's vast collection of All Might merchandise, but that hadn't erased the 10 years of obsessive fanaticism locked away in the back of his mind. He was just thankful he hadn't made an ass of himself the moment he encountered All Might in person. Closing his eyes, Izuku reflected on the encounter for several minutes. Before leaving, Nizu had promised to help him awaken the full potential of his quirk. Izuka thanked him for his consideration, but unless the tiny chimera could come up with a way for him to grind experience, there was only so much Yue could provide him. With such thoughts in mind, Izuka sat up, grabbed his journal, and opened his status. He had developed the habit of checking it before bed and documenting his progress. After all, if he abruptly gained a bunch of experience in one day, it would be useful to repeat the same actions in the future. Oh, name. Izuka Midoriya. Quirk. Digitalization. Current level. 15. 43,841 EXP. Effective level. 32. Attribute strength. 50. Agility. 50. Vitality. 100. Intelligence. 62. Dot. Dexterity. 50. Luck. 10. Free attributes. 0. Rerolls available. 1. Perks. Bronze skin. Fleet-footed, lesser regeneration, healthy body, sharp mind, 
nimble fingers. Though there were no changes in his attributes or perks, Izuka's eyes shone when he noticed his experience had increased by 1,622 since that morning. He knew he gained increased experience from fighting thanks to his spat with Bakugo, but this drastically exceeded his expectations. Even when he signed up for some self-defense classes at a local dojo, the most experience he earned in a single day was 193. It appears that enrolling in the hero course was the correct choice. The only question is, is this experience the byproduct of defeating villain bots or the result of my mental state at the time? If it's the former, I'll need to obtain my provisional hero license and apply for a work study as soon as possible. As the most common method of acquiring experience in video games was defeating monsters, Izuku presumed the fastest way to increase his level was to defeat villains. He had formed this conclusion on the very first day, but it wasn't something he could verify since confronting villains without a hero's license was against the law. He was also very weak at the time, so actively seeking out villains was like asking to be hospitalized, if not much worse. Kaya Aoi dash, hearing his mother scream. Izuku burst out of his room and bolted down the stairs with a fierce gleam in his eyes. Home invasions weren't common in Mizutafu, his hometown and the city surrounding Yue, but he would be damned if he allowed something to happen to his mother. Nearly causing Izuku to trip, a familiar voice shouted, Greetings, young Midoriya. We meet again! The moment he rounded the corner leading to his home's entryway. Regaining his footing, Izuka stared incredulously at the figure towering over his mother, the latter of which had fallen onto her, but, after all, the person at their door was none other than Japan's number one hero, All Might. Muttered Izuku, quickly collecting himself and helping his mother to her feet as he questioned, Why have you come to my home? Did the principal need something from me? Waving his hand in front of his face, All Might replied, Nothing of the sort. I'm here today because I wanted to talk to you about something. Can you lend me some of your time? Though his heart was pounding heavily in his chest, Izuka did his best to appear calm as he replied, Sure. I mean, you came all this way. It would be rude of me to refuse. Shifting his attention to his mother, who was still in shock, Izuku smiled wryly and asked, Can you prepare some tea for us, Kachan? Eh. Coming to her senses, Inko turned to meet Izuka's gaze, her round eyes expressing profound confusion as she answered, Yes, as if asking him to repeat what he had just said. Grasping his mother's shoulder, Izuka gently guided her toward the living room and kitchen as he said, Please come inside. To All Might. The latter was currently wearing a yellow business suit, but anyone could recognize him due to his impressive stature and iconic hairstyle. If he kept standing in the doorway, people from the surrounding neighborhood were bound to start gathering outside their house. Nodding his head, All Might replied, Well then, please excuse me, as he made his way inside and removed his shoes. Then, as there were no guest slippers that could fit his massive feet, he followed after Izuku and Inko in his socks. This is a nice little house you have here, remarked All Might attempting to ease tensions. I was surprised to learn you had a place so close to the school. It'll make your future commute a lot easier. Latching onto All Might's remark, Inko blinked several times and asked, Wait, does that mean Izuku has been accepted into UA High? Before abruptly exclaiming, Are you going to be his teacher? Exhaling a light-hearted chuckle, All Might casually replied, Something along those lines. It's a secret, though, so please don't go sharing it with your neighbors. Nodding her head rapidly, Inko replied, Of course! Then, having mostly recovered from her previous stupor, she turned to Izuku, smiling gently as she added, I'm okay now, sweetheart. You and Mr. All Might should make yourselves comfortable while I prepare tea and snacks. Releasing his mother's shoulder, Izuku replied, Okay, Kachan, take your time. With Inko scurrying off to the kitchen, Izuku and All Might sat opposite one another on a pair of sofas, separated by a square table. Once they had 
The atmosphere suddenly became tense as All Might asked, Are you able to check my status right now, or are there some requirements for you to do so? Shaking his head, Izuka replied, As far as I know, the only requirement is to see my target in person. I've tried using it while watching television and surfing the internet, but it didn't work. Nodding his head, All Might responded with a curt I see. Before getting to the point of his visit, his countenance becoming unquestionably serious as he said, You've seen that I possess multiple quirks, one of which lets me transfer my powers to another. Tell me, Izuku Midoriya, if you were to possess my powers, the quirks that allowed me to become the symbol of peace, how would you use them? Though he had somewhat anticipated All Might's question, Izuka's mind blanked when he heard it. If it were two days prior, he would have said he had no need for one for all. That was before he knew how vast the gap between All Might and other people was. Even if he found a way to level quickly, he couldn't fathom reaching level 60,000. I honestly don't know, replied Izuku. I would certainly do my best to use it responsibly, but I'm not even sure I could keep it under control. It amazes me how you don't annihilate everything in your surroundings by simply walking. While Izuka's answer wasn't exactly what he was looking for, All Might appreciated his honesty. It was much better than him agreeing without hesitation or blathering about how he would use his power to become the number one hero. Nodding his head in approval, All Might said, Thank you for your honesty. In exchange, allow me to tell you why I came to Mizutafu and decided to become a teacher at UA. The truth is that I'm searching for a successor, someone that can lead the next generation and replace me as the symbol of peace. And you, young Midoriya, are one of the people I'm considering for that responsibility. Hearing All Might mention he was a candidate to succeed one for all, Izuku would be lying if he said he wasn't tempted. If he managed to get his hands on such power, he could breeze through the rest of his life. The issue was that with great power came great responsibility. Furthermore, while he was determined to become more powerful, Izuku wasn't sure he wanted to spend the rest of his life as a pro-hero, much less the symbol of peace. Closing his eyes, Izuku both surprised and impressed All Might by saying, As I am, I'm unworthy of such power. After all, while it's true that I want to help people, my reasons for becoming a hero are fairly selfish. Leading the next generation and becoming the symbol of peace, I'm not sure I'm capable of such selflessness. Catching Izuku by surprise, All Might exhaled a throaty laugh, smacking his leg several times before adopting a massive grin and saying, Worry not, young Midoriya. While it's true I'm looking for a successor, it's not a pressing matter that requires an immediate response. Use these next few years at UA to better understand the kind of hero you want to be. It's not too late to give me an answer once you graduate. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, All Might rose to his feet and added, It seems our time together has to be cut short. I hear citizens in need of assistance, so I must go to them. Farewell, young Midoriya. I look forward to observing your growth, both as a person and a hero. Finished with what he had to say, All Might bolted from the room without giving Izuku a chance to see him out. As a result, the latter was left slack-jawed and silent until his mother arrived with hot tea and an entire platter of snacks. April 1st, 2149. After more than a month of hard training, allowing him to reach level 16, it was finally time for Izuku to attend his first day at UA High. Similar to the original, Izuku had been placed into Class 1A. He wouldn't have minded being put into Class 1B, but being in a familiar setting was always preferable to going in blind. Entering through his class's massive door, Izuku was surprised to find he wasn't the first person to arrive. There was nearly a full hour until the first bell so it made little sense for anyone else to be there. Noticing Izuka's arrival, a rather short girl with large eyes, a larger-than-average mouth, and dark green hair, fashioned into an ornate 
bow that extended past her hips stared back at him. Her hands were also larger than average, but instead of appearing grotesque, her overall appearance was fairly cute. Touching her lips with one of her oversized fingers, the green-haired girl remarked, I didn't expect anyone else to arrive this early, Ribbit. I was so nervous that I would be late that I came in a full hour early. I'm Tsuyu, by the way. Tsuyu Azui. Recovering from his brief stupor, Izuku adopted a friendly smile. Raising his hand as he replied, I'm Izuku Midoriya. It's a pleasure to meet you, Azui-san. Shaking her head, Azui said, Just call me Tsuyu. You're the first person I've met since becoming a student at UA, so I'd like it if we could become friends, Ribbit. Smiling a little wider, Izuka replied, I'd like that too, Tsuyu. As such, feel free to address me as Izuku. Seemingly satisfied by Izuka's response, Tsuyu adopted a similarly broad smile, replying, Okay, Izuku, before rising to her feet. There were still 51 minutes until class began, so she figured they could chat a bit once Izuku got situated at his desk. Understanding Tsuyu's intentions, Izuku made his way over to his desk, seat number 18, setting down his stuff as he asked. This may sound a little rude, but does your quirk have anything to do with frogs? I really don't mean to sound insulting, but that's the first impression I got when I saw you. Your verbal tick would seem to suggest I'm right. Instead of answering Izuku's question directly, Tsuyu tilted her head to the side and asked, If you had to say, what kind of frog do you think I resemble? Though he was somewhat taken aback by Tsuyu's response, Izuku didn't hesitate to reply, A tree frog? In a questioning tone. Adopting a smile, Tsuyu gave a slight nod and said, You're right. My quirk is related to frogs, Ribbit. What about you, Izuka-chan? Ignoring the fact that Tsuyu had added the Chan suffix to his name, Izuku explained, My quirk enhances my strength, speed, reflexes, and intellect, but the effect diminishes if I focus on more than one. I also need time to adapt to the changes in my body, so I can't freely switch from a strength-focused build to an intelligence build on the spot. Still, it's a pretty useful quirk. Blinking in surprise, Tsuyu remarked, Sound strong. My quirk only lets me do the things a frog can do, Ribbit. I'm confident in my tongue and leg strength, but my other abilities are lackluster. Your tongue? asked Izuku, fully aware that Tsuyu could extend her tongue roughly 20m. After all, when he inspected someone's status, he gained intuitive knowledge of their listed quirks. Nem, Tsuyu essay. Quirk, frog. Current level, 20. 102,405 EXP. Effective level, 28. Attributes strength, 24. Agility, 55. Vitality, 39. Intelligence, 52. Dexterity, 63. Luck, 49. Though it was a little embarrassing, Tsuyu extended her tongue until it dangled around her stomach, revealing, I can extend my tongue around 20 m and use it to grab hold of objects and people ribbit. If I push myself, I can lift around 300 kilograms. Blinking several times, Izuka parroted, 300 kilos? Seriously? That's incredible, Tsuyu. As she wasn't accustomed to praise from people outside her family, a faint blush colored Tsuyu's cheeks as she snappily retracted her tongue. Unlike the original, the current Izuku put a lot of effort into his physical appearance. He kept his hair short and faded on the sides, but the most notable difference was his confidence. While the original struggled with all manner of esteem issues, to the point he would celebrate when a girl talked to him, the current Izuku gave off a mature but approachable vibe. Amused by Tsuyu's reaction, Izuka teased, I wasn't aware frogs could blush. You're going to be popular once you become a hero. Furrowing her brows slightly, so you adopted a reproaching tone as she said, It's not nice to tease people, Izuka-chan. Besides, I might have a frog-based quirk, but I'm still a human. It's normal for me to blush, Ribbit. Deepening the ruddy hue in Tsuyu's cheeks, Izuka's smile widened as he replied, It suits you. No. Feeling that 
Izuku was a little too playful, so you briefly contemplated giving him a smack with her tongue. Instead, she combed back the bangs on the right side of her face and changed topics, focusing on subjects like which middle schools they originated from, the entrance exam, and what kind of heroes each wanted to be, though he enjoyed talking with Tsuyu. Izuku was relieved when other students began to arrive around half an hour before the bell. The first among them was Ida, who seemed genuinely shocked to discover others had come before him. Shortly after, one of the people Izuku had a vested interest in made her appearance at all. Mature-looking girl with intelligent eyes and raven-black hair tied up in a spiky ponytail. Name, Momo Yairozu. Quirk, creation, current level, 14. 39,942 EXP. Effective level, 30. Attribute strength, 21. Agility, 25. Vitality, 81. Intelligence, 73. Dexterity, 40. Luck, 63. Surprising by Yairos' vitality and intelligence attributes, Izuka's gaze lingered a little longer than it should have, prompting Tsuyu to remark, it isn't polite to stare, Izuka-chan, in a chiding tone. As the classroom wasn't very large, and there were only the four of them present, Yairozu also noticed Izuka's gaze, a polite smile adorning her face as she crossed her hands in front of her, gave a slight bow and said, Greetings, fellow students of Class 1A. My name is Momo Yairozu. I look forward to working alongside each of you as we endeavor to become dependable heroes. Seizing the opportunity Yairozu had created, Ida rose from his seat like a spring, exclaiming, What an excellent greeting! I, Tenya Ida, am also looking forward to working with everyone in our class. May we all go on to become great heroes! Seeing how intense Yairozu and Ida were, so you briefly considered not getting involved with them. Unfortunately, she already viewed Izuku as a friend, so she was left with little choice when he said, I see the two of you are mourning people. However, while it's great to be spirited, it could cause a misunderstanding if someone were to hear you shout. My name is Izuka Midoriya, by the way. It's a pleasure to meet you, Yairo Zisin. Piggybacking off of Izuka's words, Tsuyu gave a slight nod, adding, And I'm Tsuyu. Tsuyu Ajui Ribbit. Smiling slightly wider than before, Yairozu repeated, Tenya Ida, Izuka Midoriya, and Tsuyu Ajui. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. We'll be in each other's care these next three years. So please watch over and inform me if there's anything I'm doing wrong or could improve upon. I'm always open to constructive criticisms. Same here, replied Izuku. Then, to break the ice, he added, Now, why don't you drop your stuff off? And then the four of us can get to know one another? Before you arrived, Tsuyu and I were discussing what our first class might be. She thinks we'll be doing introductions, while I suggested it'll be some kind of test. This is the hero course, after all. Blinking in surprise, Yairozu asked, Do you really think they would test us on the very first day of school? Before Izuku could respond, Ida exclaimed, What utter nonsense. If you had properly reviewed the schedule, you would know we have homeroom, followed by a school assembly. Resisting the urge to deadpan or roll his eyes, Izuku responded with a curt nod, saying, You're right. However, that most likely only applies to the general, support, and business class students. We're all aspiring to become heroes. At the very least, we should expect the unexpected to ensure we're mentally prepared for anything. Unable to refute Izuka's words, Ida pushed up his glasses and remained silent. At nearly that exact moment, the door to the classroom was kicked open, followed by the entrance of a boy with crimson eyes, a perpetually pissed off expression, and ash blonde hair reminiscent of an explosion. Noticing the presence of other people, the boy remarked, Huh? There are other people here? You tryhards are wasting your dash, spotting Izuko. The boy's perpetually pissed off expression became even more so as he screamed, Deku? Why the hell is a pathetic weakling like you here? Do you want to die? 
Taken aback by the boy's, Bakugo's, crass words and actions, Yayorozu covered her mouth in shock. Izuku, however, maintained a calm smile as he replied, I'm here because I passed the entrance exam. I imagine you have a similar reason. Creating an explosion in his left hand, Bakugo screamed, Don't you dare compare the two of us! I'm nothing like you and these extras! Undaunted by Bakugo's outburst, the corners of Azuka's smile curled upward as he retorted, You're right. Everyone here is aspiring to become a hero that others can look up to and feel safe around. We're absolutely nothing like you. Interpreting the relaxed smile on Azuka's face as a smug look, Bakugo's left brow twitched as he growled, What did you just say to me, you little shit? Raising his brows slightly, Izuku retorted, What? Use your quirk. So often you've become hard of hearing. As expected of the future number one, explosive hero, big ego, Deku. That's enough! exclaimed Ida. As future heroes and students of the illustrious UA High School, you should not be squabbling like children! Shifting his furious gaze from Izuku to Ida, Bakugo bellowed, but out, you extra! This is between me and Deku! Still wearing his relaxed smile, Izuka pointed out, That isn't really true though, is it? I've minded my own business for the past two years, yet you continuously insult or try to obstruct me. You seem to think I'm trying to surpass you. But the truth is that we've been following different paths for a while. Give it a rest already. Balling his hands into fists, Bakugo glared at Izuku with a mixture of anger and bitterness in his gaze as he growled. You, I'm not Dash, interrupting Bakugo's imminent tirade. Izuka's expression briefly became serious as he stated, My name isn't you, it's Izuku Midoriya. Don't call me familiarly in the future. We're not that close, Katsuki Bakugo. Blinking in surprise, a look of genuine confusion tinged Bakugo's fury. He and... Izuku had known each other since they were two, maybe three years old. The latter had even allowed him to call him Deko. So Bakugo's mind stalled a bit when Izuka said not to address him familiarly in the future. In a sense, it was like Izuku was cutting ties with him. Intruding upon the tense atmosphere, a girl with distinct pale pink skin, somewhat square-shaped eyes with black scara, tiny yellow horns, and fluffy pink hair popped her head into the room asking, am I in the right place? This is Classroom 1A of the UA High Hero course, right? Nem, Nena Eshedo, Quirk, Acid, Current Level, 17, 62,102 EXP, Effective Level, 24, Attributes Strength, 25, Agility, 31, Vitality, 51, Intelligence, 47. Dexterity. 44. Luck. 41. Without waiting for a response, the predominantly pink girl, Mina Ashido, entered the classroom. She had a fairly medium build, but it was clear she took care of herself. Even if he didn't know what she was like in the anime, Izuka could tell she was extremely fit and athletic. Since Yayorozu was the closest, Ashido's yellow eyes focused on her as she raised her right hand and said, My name is Mina Ashido. Mind if I ask for yours? In an overtly friendly tone. Recovering from the shock of witnessing Bakugo's behavior, Yairozu regained her smile and replied, Momo Yairozu, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Ashidosan. Acting as if she hadn't walked in on a veritable powder keg, Ashido's eyes glistened her expression beaming as she mused. The pleasure's mine. I mean, you're super beautiful, Yairoza-san. You've got to tell me what kind of skincare routine you do. Though she was taken aback by the sudden compliment, Yairoza's smile broadened as she replied, You're too kind, Ashido-san. Also, from what I can tell, the condition of your skin is immaculate. If anyone should be asking for advice, it's me. With Yairozu and Ashida, Abruptly starting a girl's talk, the classroom atmosphere suddenly became much livelier. Bakugo was still angry, but he ultimately clicked his tongue, slid his hands in his pockets, and made his way over to the so-called protagonist's seat. 
His assigned seat was next to Azuka's seat number 17, but there was no way in hell he was going to sit there right now. As time counted down to the start of class, the remaining students of class 1A trickled in. Izuku inspected each of them as they arrived, but only a handful caught his attention. Of particular note were Mashireo Ojiro, a plain-looking boy with short blonde hair and a prehensile tail, Aijiro Kurishima, a spirited youth with spiky red hair, Mizo Shoji, an inordinately tall young man with ashen hair and six arms, Fumikage Tokoyami, an edgy kid with the head of a raven and Shoto Todoroki, a fairly handsome youth with distinctive white and red hair, perfectly split down the middle, and a prominent burn scar over his left eye. Name. Mashireo Ojiro. Quirk. Tail. Current level, 20. 104,312 EXP. Effective level, 29. Attributes Strength, 53. Agility, 37. Vitality, 81. Intelligence, 38. Dexterity, 52. Luck, 37. Nim. Ezro Kurishina. Quirk. Hardening. Current level, 17. 67,845 EXP. Effective level, 27. Attributes Strength, 61. Agility, 27. Vitality, 103. Intelligence, 19. Dexterity, 25. Luck, 38. Name, Mizo Shoji. Quirk, Dupli Arms. Current level, 20. 147,100 EXP. Effective level, 48. Attribute Strength, 137. Agility, 29. Vitality, 190. Intelligence, 28. Dexterity, 63. Luck, 35. Name, Fumikage Tokoyami. Quirk, Dark Shadow. Current level, 16. 58,483 EXP. Effective level, 24. Attribute Strength, 22. Agility, 41. Vitality, 63. Intelligence, 39. Dexterity, 44. Luck, 40. Name, Shoto Todoroki. Quirk, half cold, half hot. Current level, 22. 214,773 EXP. Effective level, 53. Attributes Strength, 51. Agility, 44. Vitality, 158. Intelligence, 57. Dexterity, 63. Luck, 161. Though the six-armed Mizo Shoji was easily the strongest in the class, Shoto Todoroki's talent was in a league of its own. With the exceptions of Principal Nizu and Tashinori All Might, Izuku had never seen a luck stat exceeding 100. Bakugo's was pretty close, having reached 88 after training seriously for two years, but that was barely even half of Todoroki's. It was clear that the icy hot youth wasn't just talented. He had trained his ass off to become exceptional. Excluding the boys, his future rivals, Izuku also paid special attention to each of his female classmates. The one that most closely matched his natural disposition was a fairly plain-looking girl with a slender build, lazy-looking eyes, dark purple hair, and peculiar earlobes that resembled plug-like earphone jacks. Her attributes were among the lowest in the class, but as a fan of metal, punk rock, and rock and roll, Izuku believed they would get along. Nen, Kyukajiro, Quirk, Earphone Jack. Current level, 10. 14,003 EXP. Effective level, 14. Attribute Strength, 11. Agility, 13. Vitality, 31. Intelligence, 35. Dexterity, 19. Luck, 40. Alongside Ishido Azui Tsuyu and Yairozu, Jiro was one of only six girls in class one. A's group of 20 students. The last two were Achiko Yurarka and Toru Hagakure, the former nowhere to be seen and the latter quite literally invisible. Even so, 
Izuku had no issues inspecting her stats, earning himself a slightly accusatory look from Tsuyu since he had to look at Hagakure's body to do so. Nen, Turahagakure, Quirk, Invisibility, Current Level, 16, 56,007 EXP, Effective Level, 25, Attributes Strength, 23, Agility, 30, Vitality, 49, Intelligence, 51, Dexterity, 40, Luck, 63. Despite being invisible, Hagakure's peculiar appearance and bubbly personality garnered quite a bit of attention. Her body may have been invisible, but her uniform wasn't. As such, it was possible to tell she had an amazing body, second only to Yairo's. As strange as it might sound, Izuku found Hagakure to be the most appealing girl in the entire class. He couldn't see her face, but there was something about the notion of an invisible girl that stoked his intrigue and curiosity. He would never do so, but a part of him really wanted to sneak a glimpse down Hagakure's collar or upper skirt. The only thing he was bound to find was the inside of a bra or a floating pair of panties. But that was kind of the point, unfortunately. While Izuku was interested in getting to know Hagakure, it was nearly impossible for most guys to intrude upon a group of girls in the midst of a conversation. Izuku wasn't lacking in confidence, but he would need to part ways with Tsuyu if he wanted to attempt it. The two of them had already become friends, so he couldn't just leave her to try and join a group comprised of nothing but girls. Instead, he made conversation with those in his immediate surroundings, specifically Kurishima, a spiky-haired boy with electric powers named Kaminari, and, somewhat reluctantly, the lecherous, grape-headed midget known as Minoru Mineta, name Denki Kaminari, Quirk, Electrification, Current Level, 15, 47,777 EXP, Effective Level, 24, Attributes, Strength, 25, Agility, 31, Vitality, 55, Intelligence, 20, Dexterity, 34, Luck, 77, Name, Minoru Mineta, Quirk, Pop Off, Current Level, 9, 8,212 EXP, Effective Level, 29, Attributes, Strength, 7, Agility, 13, Vitality, 63, Intelligence, 69, Dexterity, 41, Luck, 93. Though Mineta's physical attributes were among the worst in the class, his effective level was among the highest thanks to his intelligence and inordinately high luck. Izuku really wanted to smack him, especially when Mineta abruptly asked if he and Tsu were dating, but he didn't want to risk the rapport he had built with Principal Nizu and All Might. He had no doubt the duo would be paying attention to his actions, so he intended to play nice in an effort to become the class's center. Fortunately, Mineta was among the last students to arrive, so Izuku didn't have to put up with him for too long. The two sat beside one other, but he knew the perverse Mineta would be far more focused on the girl seated to his right than the boy seated to his left. After all, the unlucky lass sitting in the last seat Seat number 20 was Momo Yairozo. With less than two minutes remaining until the first bell, the door to the classroom abruptly slid open, followed by the nearly late appearance of a Yurarika. Her arrival garnered the attention of everyone in the class, but it was Ida who took it upon himself to address her, rushing over to say, It's the first day of our training at UA High. You should have arrived at least 15 minutes early. Recognizing Ida from the entrance exam, Yurarka smiled awkwardly as she replied, I know, but there was a delay at the station that required my train to be rerouted. I won't be late in the future. Furrowing his brows, Ida was about to express that heroes didn't make excuses, but swallowed his words when Izuku appeared, placing his hand on the much taller boy's shoulder as he said, Give it a rest, Ida-san. You already expressed your opinion, and she said she would be arriving earlier from now on. What more would you ask from her? Without waiting for his response, Izuku shifted his attention to the floor outside the classroom's entrance, adding, 
Besides, it would appear our sensei has arrived. We should probably go to our seats. Eh. Following Izuka's gaze, Yuraka turned around to find a man lying on the ground in a sleeping bag. His position was questionable, as he was lying below and behind a girl wearing a skirt, but he fortunately had his eyes closed. Having heard Izuka's remark, the man in the sleeping bag roused, revealing himself to be a haggard man with long, greasy black hair and half-opened eyes. His hair hung over his stubbly, lazy-looking face, but his most prominent features were the distinctive gray bandages around his neck and shoulders and his predominantly black clothing, name Shota Aizawa, Quirk Eraser, Current Level 40. 1,038,711 EXP. Effective level, 49. Attributes strength, 62. Agility, 40. Vitality, 166. Intelligence, 81. Dexterity, 92. Luck, 52. After shedding his sleeping bag like a pupa emerging from its shell, the gangly man revealed, I'm your homeroom teacher, Shota Aizawa. And this is the Department of Heroics, not a place for kids to socialize. Punctuating his words, Aizawa pulled one of Yue Hai's distinctive training uniforms from his sleeping bag, holding it out to Izuku as he said, You can get yourselves changed at the Gamma Lockers. After that, head over to Field Gamma. We only have three years to transform your sorry lot from incompetent brats to semi common heroes, so don't dawdle. With Izuku readily accepting the offered uniform, the man turned to the rest of the class, surprising nearly everyone as he added, We're going to be conducting a quirk apprehension test. After getting changed and being one of the first to arrive at Field Gamma, Izuku proceeded to do some warm-up exercises until Tsuyu came over to say, Looks like you were right about there being a test, Izuka-chan. With him rising from his position on the ground, Izuku looked up at Tsuyu and explained, Everyone here is aspiring to become a future pro. We may be saddled with a few compulsory education classes, but the rest of our curriculum should revolve around the development of our quirks and the skills we'll need to become heroes. Touching the side of her face, a habit she had developed when thinking, Tsuyu replied, That makes sense, Ribbit. I should do some stretching as well, shouldn't I? Adopting a smile, Izuku answered, it couldn't hurt, before continuing his lower back stretches. When Tsuyu began performing her own routine a short distance away from him, several other students felt compelled to do the same. This included Yurarika, who, after thanking Izuku for coming to her aid earlier, joined Tsuyu for some buddy stretching exercises. Observing the chain reaction caused by Izuku, Aizawa gave an approving nod from his perch atop an observation platform. He normally had to give new students a reality check before they understood the significance of being a UA student. He still intended to do precisely that, but he was relieved to see at least one person in the group taking things seriously. A few minutes after the last student had arrived, Aizawa appeared with a softball in hand. Expecting at least a basic explanation, Izuku was a little caught off guard when Aizawa tossed the softball at him, asking, how far were you able to pitch a softball in middle school? Around 53 meters, replied Izuku. But that was without the use of my quirk. With it, I'm sure I could throw it a lot further. Hearing Izuku mention that he had a quirk, the perpetual frown on the nearby Bakugo's face deepened. He had expected there to be a reason for Izuku's drastic change in their second year of middle school, but he hadn't considered it was related to a quirk. Nodding in affirmation, Aizawa said, That's the reason for this test. In middle school, you were forbidden from using your quirks on the principle of fairness. However, the world has never been a fair place. If it were, we wouldn't have villains running amok, nor would we require heroes. Passing his gaze over the rest of the class, Aizawa's expression and tone harshened as he declared, The UA Department of Heroics is no place for concepts such as mundane or average. Less than 0.4% of the population has what it takes to obtain the mantle of hero. 
If you wish to remain in Class 1A, you must be nothing short of exceptional. If you demonstrate you can't make the cut, you will be replaced. Pulling out a Caperson-like pouch of gelatinized coffee, Aizawa took a moment to alleviate his parched throat before adding. That being said, the person with the lowest score in today's quirk apprehension test will be expelled. If you don't want to experience regret, I recommend doing your best. Returning his gaze to Izuku, a somewhat sadistic smile developed across Aizawa's face as he said, You seem to be something of a trendsetter in the class. Well, time to step up to the plate, kid. Show me and everyone here what you can do. If that isn't enough, push beyond your limits and go even further. That's the meaning of plus ultra. Adopting a serious expression, Izuku ignored the commotion caused by Aizawa's statement and stepped up to the pitch. He knew Aizawa wasn't serious about expelling anyone, but that wouldn't stop him from trying his best. After all, as much as he preferred older women, he was stuck in the body of a 14-year-old. Unless he intended to spend the next three years as a single dog, he would need to work hard to impress the girls in his class. Having already stretched his body and warmed up, Izuku only hesitated for the time it took him to wind up before throwing the softball with all his strength. His movements didn't generate shockwaves or any other flashy effects, but he was reasonably satisfied when Aizawa held up a handheld device that displayed distance declaring 177.5 meters. Pretty impressive for an otherwise ordinary toss. Raising his right hand and balling it into a fist, Izuku adopted a toothy grin as he said, Thanks, but my real power lies in my leg strength and speed. If we get to do any distance running, I'm confident in defeating everyone here except Ida-san. Though his words unabashedly elevated himself, Izuka didn't come off as too arrogant since he admitted to lacking confidence against Ida. People hated braggarts. So a touch of humility went a long way when attempting to cultivate trust and build positive rapport with your peers. Seeing through Izuka's intentions, Aizawa felt the urge to roll his eyes but ultimately decided to lend the former a hand, stating, Lucky you. We'll be doing a 50 meter dash next, and distance running a bit later. Just try not to trip and embarrass yourself while attempting to show off. With Aizawa's remark earning a few chuckles from the rest of the class, Izuku seized the opportunity to exhibit a bit of shamelessness, his smile broadening as he nodded his head and said, I'll be sure to keep that in mind. Thanks for the advice, Sensei. This brat, thought Aizawa, his scarf concealing a faint smile. It was rare for someone as young as Izuku to be calm and discerning, especially in the presence of authority. While everyone else was either unnerved or motivated by his previous threat, Izuku didn't exhibit so much as a trace of nervousness. Instead, it appeared he was actively lightening the mood for the rest of his class. True to his word, and much to the frustration of Bakugo, Izuku made good on his promise by securing second place in the 50 meter dash. His time of 3.4 S was just behind Ida's 3.04 S, but that was mainly due to the latter's quirk allowing him to accelerate much faster. Fortunately, though he only came in second place, Izuku proved he had the advantage when covering greater distances. Ida's agility was much higher than his, but his vitality couldn't keep up with it. Izuka's perfectly complemented one another, so he could maintain his speed for a much longer period. If not for Yairoza utilizing her creation quirk to produce an electric scooter whose top speed exceeded 120 km per hour, he would have easily claimed first. Speaking of Yairozu, she dominated nearly every event in the quirk apprehension test. Her worst performance was during the grip strength test, since Aizawa rejected her idea of creating a literal hydraulic press to crush the measurement device. When it came to the standing long jump, repeated side steps, ball throw, seated toe touch, and sit-ups, she always came in either first, second, or third place. Though his training and dexterity afforded him considerable flexibility, Izuku, like most of the boys, was nowhere near as limber as some of the girls. Tsuyu, in particular, made the seated toe touch look like a joke as her body was flexible 
to the point of a contortionist's. She didn't exhibit it, but according to her, she could execute even the most complicated yoga poses with little difficulty. After securing second or third place in nearly every event, Izuku was fairly content when Aizawa used a handheld holographic projector to display the final results. First, Momo Yairozu. Second, Izuka Midoriya. Third, Shoto Todoroki. Fourth, Katsuki Bokogo. Lima Teha Dunya Ida. Sixth, Fumikage Tokoyami. Seventh, Mizo Shoji. Eighth, Mashireo Ojiro. Ninth, Aijiro Kurishima. Tenth, Mina Ashido. Eleventh, Achiko Yurarika. Twelfth, Koji Koda. Thirteenth, Rikido Sato. Fourteenth, Tsuyu Ajui. Fifteenth, Yuga Aoyama. Sixteenth, Hanta Siro. Seventeenth, Denki Kaminari. Eighteenth, Kyokujiro. Nineteenth, Toru Hagakure. Twentieth, Minoru Mineta. Contrasting Izuka's satisfaction, Bakugo had a borderline murderous look on his face as he screamed, This is impossible. There's no way I'm worse than someone like Deku. Similarly distraught by the results, Mineta was on his hands and knees, a steady stream of tears pouring from his eyes as he muttered, Expelled on the first day? Exhibiting a general lack of regard for the duo's opinion and feelings, Aizawa's expression and tone were cold as he stared down Bakugo and asserted, If you were going to complain about the results, you should have tried harder during the tests. Then, catching even Azuka by surprise, he looked to Mineta and added, As for you, hurry up and go get changed. As of this moment, you're expelled from the hero course. No, exclaimed Mineta before crawling toward Aizawa like some kind of strange insect as he screamed, Please give me another chance, Aizawa sensei. I can do better. I will do better. Ignoring Mineta completely, Aizawa passed his gaze over the rest of the class, saying, This concludes the quirk apprehension test. Get changed over and return to class. You'll find your schedules and curriculum sheets posted inside your desks. Since today is a half day, you can use the rest of homeroom to familiarize yourselves with one another. Without waiting for anyone to respond, and with Mineta still clinging to his leg, Aizawa turned around and walked away. In his wake, a tense silence descended upon everyone present, some exhibiting disbelief, while others were relieved they weren't the ones expelled. Shattering this tentative silence, Bakugo screamed, Deku! before charging over to Izuku and attempting to grab his collar. What he never expected, not in a million years, was Izuku grasping his wrist, performing a military-style takedown and shouting, My name is Izuku Midoriya, and I didn't enroll in UA to play around. This isn't middle school, Bakugo. Stop behaving like a schoolyard thug and start acting like the hero you want to be. Punctuating his words, Izuku gave the already pinned Bakugo a powerful shove forcing his face into the ground as he rose to his feet. He was sick and tired of Bakugo's shit. So, understanding there were cameras all over the campus, Izuka didn't hesitate to defend himself. If he were lucky, the school would place Bakugo in class 1B to separate them. If not, he could at least make a case for having Bakugo moved to a different seat. As expected, Bakugo didn't take kindly to being embarrassed in front of his peers. The moment Izuku got off of him, he used his quirk to blast himself to his feet, his expression resembling an escaped mental patient as he roared, You're dead! in a feral tone. With Bakugo's firepower and dexterity being quite a bit higher than his, Izuku abandoned the idea of attacking directly. Instead, he raised his arms in a peekaboo boxing posture, shielding his face as the former made the biggest mistake of his academic career using his quirk against another student outside of training. Feeling the heat from Bakugo's quirk wash over him, Izuku couldn't help thinking, checkmate, even as he was sent flying backward. The former had held back quite a bit, but it was his first time using his quirk against another person. Were it not for Izuku's bronze skin perk, things wouldn't have ended with a simple trip to the nurse's office. 
Before Izuku could fly too far, a pair of hands cradled his body and the back of his head as a familiar voice shouted, What's going on here? Why on earth would you use your quirk to attack a fellow student? While Izuku wasn't even remotely surprised by the identity of the voice's owner, everyone else in the class, excluding the wide-eyed Bakugo, had the exact same response, shouting, All Might, in equal parts surprise and disbelief. After all, while rumors about All Might becoming a teacher at UA had already begun to circulate, they never expected that he would appear at such a time, much less without a trace of his usual smile. With Bakugo's behavior constituting multiple felonies, battery, and intent to cause bodily harm being the least among them, Izuku wasn't surprised when he was called in for a meeting with Principal Nizu. Thank you for coming, Midoriya Cohen. It's a shame our reunion couldn't be on a happier note. Matching Principal Nizu's smile, Izuku replied, Such is life. Expect the unexpected, as they say. Exhaling a light-hearted chuckle, Nizu remarked, Right you are. Then, getting straight to business, he added, I asked you here to discuss how you would like to handle the situation regarding your classmate, Katsuki Bakugo. You are well, within your right to press charges against him. But Dash, interrupting Nisa's statement, Izuku shook his head and revealed, I've already resolved to leave this matter to the discretion of Principal Nizu and the trustworthy staff of UA. I know better than most that Bakugo isn't genuinely malicious. He simply needs proper guidance. Waiting until Izuku was finished speaking, Niza's smile broadened as he asserted, You truly are a very mature and dependable young man. Rest assured, I can personally guarantee that young Bakugo Koen will receive the best guidance UA can offer. Thank you for your time and cooperation. You may leave now. Nodding his head, Izuku rose to his feet and prepared to leave Principal Niza's office. Before he could... Nizu called out to him, adding, Oh, and I approved your request to use the support class facilities. You'll only have access to them on Sundays, but if you're willing to give up your free time, a member of our staff will be more than happy to supervise you. As UA utilized a long week system, meaning students attended classes Monday through Saturday, they only had Sundays to themselves. Izuku, however, didn't mind sacrificing his free time if it meant being able to use UA support facilities and equipment free of charge. Acquiring materials was extremely costly, and many of the more useful items he tried getting his hands on were prohibited to civilians. With the nearly endless budget UA provided the Department of Production and Support, Izuku could save himself a ton of time, energy, and money. Unable to suppress the urge, a broad smile developed across Izuka's face as he replied, Thank you for informing me, in an audibly excited tone. He felt his actions were a little childish, but as a bona fide 14-year-old, he quickly forgave himself. Amused by Izuka's response, Nizu exhaled another light-hearted chuckle before advising, You should be on your way, and be careful on your way home. Mizutafu is one of the safest cities in the prefecture. But, as you so pertinently pointed out, you never know what to expect. After bowing his head and thanking Mizu for his advice, Izuka departed the former's office with a smile. He was glad he had entrusted Mizu with his secret, as the peculiar Chimera was quickly becoming one of his most dependable allies. With Mizu being one of the most influential people in Japan and the world's sixth wealthiest person, Having his support would make things much easier for Izuka down the line. As classes had let out nearly half an hour prior, Izuku was surprised to find Tsuyu and Yurarka standing near the school's front gate, seemingly waiting for him. Confirming Izuku's suspicions, Yurarka waved her hand and called out to him when she noticed his approach, shouting, Oh, Midoriya Kuin, let's go to the station together, in a cheerful tone. Though he had initially intended to run home, going so far as to change into his gym clothes, Izuku didn't hesitate to respond, I would be a fool to refuse the company of two cute girls. Not expecting Izuku to call them cute out of nowhere, Yurarka laughed nervously, while Tsuyu blushed, remarking, You should be more careful with your words, Izuka-chan. 
You could cause a misunderstanding if you go around calling every girl you meet cute. Shaking his head and maintaining a confident smile, Izuku asserted, I don't go around calling every girl cute, only those I genuinely believe to be charming. I'm willing to withhold such remarks if they make either of you uncomfortable, but I prefer to speak my mind. Similar to when he had embarrassed her earlier that morning, Tsuyu hung her head slightly and made a muffled groaning sound. As for Eurarika, her face was completely red as she pressed the pink padded tips of her index fingers together and muttered, I don't really mind it. But I also agree with Tsuyu, it would be best if you used polite speech until we're a bit closer. Without missing a beat, Izuka's smile broadened as he said, Then I look forward to becoming closer to you both. To that end, feel free to address me by my given name in the future, preferably without the Chan. Understanding that Izuka's final few words were directed at her, Tsuyu stared back at him with a somewhat blank look as she said, I add Chan to everyone's name, Ribbit. Instead of contesting the matter, Izuku gave a helpless shrug and said, Then you're welcome to continue doing so. Just don't complain when I start calling you Tsuyu Chan. Though her eyes were already remarkably round, Tsuyu managed to appear wide eyed as she heard Izuku's form of address. It wasn't the first time someone had called her Tsuyu Chan, but it made her heart skip a beat. At the same time, she felt a sudden and intense desire to smack Izuku with her tongue. April 2nd, 2149. After teasing them the previous day, Izuku wasn't too surprised when Tsuyu and Yurarika, now Achiko, basically ignored him. They returned his greeting when he called out to them, but made no attempt to come over to his seat when he dropped off his stuff. Instead, they sat together in the front row, Yurarika borrowing Ida's seat as the two conversed without him. Since he had anticipated the duo's reaction, Izuku didn't try to intrude on their discussion. Instead, he took advantage of the fact that Hagakure and Ashido had gathered around Yairozu, the former sitting in Mineta's currently unoccupied seat. Disregarding the unspoken rule that prohibited boys from interfering in an ongoing discussion between girls, Izuku surprised the trio by asking, are you sure you want to sit there, Hagakure-san? If Mineta arrives and finds his seat warm, you may regret it. Though his words were polite, Izuka mentioning that she was warming Mineta's seat caused Hagakure to blush. It wasn't visible to anyone, but her body language made it clear she was embarrassed as she waved her invisible hands and said, W, what are you talking about, Midoriya Kuin? Mineta Kuin was expelled after the quirk apprehension test. He shouldn't be coming to class. Maintaining a completely relaxed expression, Midoriya retorted, Don't be so sure. Even if he was expelled, it's possible for him to be accepted back into the class. Aizawa-sensei seems like the type to make good on his threats, but I can't imagine him severing the path of a future hero over a simple test. I imagine he's speaking with Minetakuen right this instant to explain the significance of yesterday's lesson. With Izuku's speculation about them being tested on the first day ultimately proving true, Yairoza piggybacked his words, stating, I believe there is some truth to Midoriya Kuen's assertions. You may wish to vacate that seat, Hagakure-san. Minoru Mineta is a very peculiar boy. As the girls had already formed their initial opinions of everyone in the class, especially the boys, Hagakure practically leaped to her feet after Yairoza's words. She would never say it aloud, but she and the other girls had secretly been relieved when Mineta was the one expelled from the class. Now that there was even a slight possibility of his return, she regretted her careless act of sitting in his seat. Amused by Hagakure's reaction, Ashido exhaled a good-natured laugh before teasing, You're so cute, Hagakure. Then, meeting Izuka's gaze, she added, And you're pretty bold, izuka Kuin. Not many guys can insert themselves into a girl's conversation as if it's perfectly normal. You must have been pretty popular in middle school. Shaking his head, Izuku unashamedly revealed, Quite the opposite. You see, before I turned 13, I was quirkless. I also had a fairly nervous disposition and neglected my physical appearance, 
So I was often bullied and regarded as a nerd due to my obsession with hero statistics. It was only after I obtained my quirk that I managed to get myself together and became the man I am today. Hearing Izuku unabashedly call himself a man, a light-hearted chuckle emanated from Ashido's throat. She couldn't deny he gave off a mature, somewhat dependable aura, but it was difficult to distinguish how much of his behavior was an act. This wasn't her first time dealing with a boy who had undergone a drastic transformation, so only time could reveal how much of Azuka's behavior was genuine. Voicing the thoughts of the other two girls, Yairozu remarked, It's pretty rare for someone to awaken their quirks so late. If you don't mind my asking, what exactly is the nature of your ability? Though he was hoping for a bit of empathy concerning the fact he was bullied for being quirkless, Izuka wasn't too disappointed, as most of that was experienced by the original. He had inherited the latter's memories, but much like he lacked a proper mother-son bond with Inko, he never experienced the stress, fear, and anxiety that Deko had to live with every day since the revelation of his quirklessness. To be honest, I'm still familiarizing myself with its capabilities. I've only had it for around two years, so there's a lot I don't understand. For the most part, it periodically allows me to enhance my strength, speed, and intellect. I'm currently maintaining a balance between all three. Blinking in surprise, Yairosa questioned, Does that mean you're even stronger and faster than you demonstrated yesterday? Nodding his head, Izuka clarified, If I invested all of my energy into pure strength or speed, I'd be about three times as strong or fast. However, as my body takes time to adapt to the changes, I would risk harming myself if I focused on a single one. Rejoining the conversation, Ashido pointed out, Even so, your quirk sounds amazing. Mine mostly just allows me to produce corrosive liquid. I can control the pH levels, but there are a ton of downsides. Just imagining how much I'll have to pay in reparations and property damage is enough to make me lose sleep. Seizing the opportunity to dish out some compliments, Izuku attempted to comfort Ishido by casually remarking, Look on the bright side. You're cute and have a somewhat exotic appearance. Empty Lady also causes a ton of property damage, but she's moving up the HBC like crazy. You should have no trouble emulating potentially even exceeding her performance. Slugging Izuku in his arm, Ashida couldn't restrain a smile as she said, You little tease. I was wondering why Azui and Urarika were behaving strangely. Casting your net pretty wide, aren't you? Instead of refuting Ishido's claim, Izuku pretended to massage the pain from his shoulder as he questioned, Can you blame me? All the girls in our class are super cute. I know it's not why we came here, but I would be an idiot if I didn't at least try and establish a positive rapport with each of you. Amused by Izuka's honesty, Ashido's smile broadened as she said, You really are bold. You also seem like a pretty fun guy to be around. So the two of you S should hang out sometime. There's a neat little cafe not too far from campus. How about accompanying me there after school? Realizing that Ashido was asking him out. The gears in Azuka's mind came screeching to a halt. She wasn't wrong when she said he was casting his net wide, so he didn't expect to catch anything so quickly. Even more amused after seeing Azuka tense, Ashido narrowed her eyes and agreed on his behalf, saying, It's a date then, before punctuating her statement with a playful wink. With the morning bell sounding, Aizawa entered the classroom looking like a man who hadn't slept in weeks. This sentiment was reinforced when he stepped up to the classroom's podium. His expression and tone tinged with exhaustion as he said, Good! Everyone's here. We'll be receiving two new students today. Try and get along. As neither Bakugo nor Mineta were present, Aizawa mentioning that everyone was present caused a few students to gulp. Fortunately, though no one celebrated, at least one of the new students was someone they recognized. With somewhat sunken eyes and a noticeably pale complexion, Mineta stood before the class and mechanically muttered, Hello everyone, my name is Minoru Mineta, 
and I'll be your classmate from now on. Following my Netta's introduction, a much taller boy with messy indigo hair and half-lidded, seemingly exhausted eyes raised his hand and said, My name is Hitoshi Shinso. I was previously in classroom 1C of the General Studies Department. Due to your former classmate's mistake, it seems I'll be a member of the Hero Department from now on. Following the duo's introductions, Mineta was allowed to return to his old seat, while Shinso was assigned Bakugos. After that, Aizawa got on with Homeroom, providing an overview of UA's facilities and explaining who to contact if they were having trouble at home or with UA's admittedly taxing curriculum. Once those formalities were out of the way, he pulled out his sleeping bag and gave everyone free time until their first period of state-mandated classes, English studies. Though UA was the number one school of heroics, the first half of the day was set aside for general studies such as math, English, Japanese, and art history. After that, students of the Department of Heroics would have an hour for lunch before attending classes that would prepare them to become heroes. A seemingly random mix of theoretical and practical lessons, colloquially referred to as foundational hero studies. After an exceptionally boring first half of the day, most of the guys from class one they were seated together in the cafeteria. This included Izuku, who had temporarily been prohibited from interacting with the girls group, not because he had done anything wrong, but because the girls didn't want a boy listening in on their private conversation. Man, I can't believe Bakugo was kicked out of the hero course, said the red-headed, spiky-haired Kurishima. He and Bakugo hadn't had the time to become friends, but it felt unnerving for the person previously ranked first in their class to be gone. Pushing up his glasses, Ida retorted, Katsuki Bakugo's expulsion from the hero course is the consequence of his actions. It would harm Yue's illustrious reputation if such a foul-mouthed, violence-prone brute were allowed to become a hero. As they had all witnessed Bakugo's behavior and manner of speaking, no one could refute Ida's words. A few looked like they had something to say, but it was Izuku who asserted, While it's true that Bakugo has some behavioral issues, you shouldn't preclude him from becoming a hero just yet. Everyone has the capacity for change, and while his attitude might be unbecoming for a hero, Bakugo genuinely wishes to help people. I expect that within a few months' time, he will be rejoining the hero course anew, not expecting Izuku of all people. To speak in defense of Bakugo, Ida's ever-serious expression became notably reflective. Due to the previous day's events, he regarded Izuku as the person closest to becoming a true hero within their class. If nothing else, his level-headedness, confidence, and ability to see the positives in every situation were commendable. Nodding his head after a moment of introspection, Ida said, I have taken your words to heart. Instead of condemning Bakugo for his past actions, I will cling to the hope that he may be reformed. If any school is capable of such a feat, it's UA. With nearly everyone nodding in agreement, the conversation abruptly shifted from Bakugo to a comparably juicy topic as Kaminari said. Let's forget about Bakugo. What I want to know is how Midoriya managed to secure a date on the second day of school. Seriously, man. Tell us your secrets. Adopting a somewhat wry smile, Izuku replied, To be perfectly honest, I'm just as surprised as you are. I certainly hoped to date at least one of the girls in our class, but I never expected it to happen this soon. I mean, just look at how cute they all are. I figured it would be at least half a year before I had a chance with any of them. Hearing that Izuku already had a date, Mineta's expression resembled that of a vengeful spirit as he asked, Which girl is it? Don't tell me it's the person that was sitting in my seat. Since the girls of class 1A weren't seated that far away, Izuka's voice was a little louder than necessary as he replied, I wish. I mean, I'm not even remotely disappointed that Ashido-san was the one to invite me on a date, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't interested in Hagakure. Just by listening to her voice... I can tell she's super cute. Though he had never seen Hagakure's true form, 
Izuku remembered one of his buddies from his previous life mentioning she was canonically the cutest girl in the entire series. She just happened to be invisible to both the naked eye and most spectroscopic devices, which was a real shame considering her hero costume was essentially her walking around naked. While the boys were talking about them over at their table, the girls were listening in on them using an audio receiver Shido had asked Yairozu to place under their table. The latter had initially been reluctant to spy on her classmates, but Ashido managed to convince her it was for the safety and well-being of every girl in class. Hearing Izuka's claim that he could tell she was cute by the sound of her voice, Hagakure cupped her invisible face with her equally invisible hands as she said, how embarrassing, in a faint but discernibly gratified tone. Exhaling a faint sigh, Ashido sitting with her arms crossed and a smile on her face, remarked, He's a dangerous one, that Midoriya. He isn't a bad guy per se, but he has the potential to become a womanizer. I'll have to test him when we go on our date this afternoon. Blinking in surprise, Achiko asked, Is that why you asked him to go out with you? I'm not sure how I feel about that. Shrugging her shoulders, Ishido asserted, I know what you mean but someone has to determine his true nature. A maiden's heart, once broken, can never be fully healed. I'm fairly confident in my abilities, so if he tries anything, I'll be able to protect myself. Though she had been one of the most popular girls in her elementary and middle schools, Ashido had struggled with finding a boyfriend since most of the boys who confessed to her were strange or perverted. She did her best to turn down each of them politely, but they invariably spread rumors that her acidic quirk would melt anyone who dared to date her. It didn't help that the internet allowed them to easily find and distribute grotesque photos of people that had survived acid attacks. Adopting a broad smile, Ashido preempted Achiko's response by saying, Don't worry, Yuraraka-san. My intuition regarding things like, this is pretty sharp, so I'm fairly certain that Midoriya is a decent guy. Once I confirm that to be the case, you and Tsuyu can decide which of you should date him for real. I'm just the litmus test. Pun intended. Hearing Ashido mention the possibility of them dating Izuku, Achiko, and Tsuyu exhibited varying degrees of embarrassment. Neither of them had ever gone on a date, and before now, they hadn't really considered trying to find a boyfriend. The possibility had certainly crossed their minds, but their primary focus was becoming heroes. Amused by the duo's innocent reactions, Ashido narrowed her eyes and teased, If you can't come to a decision, don't be too surprised if one of us beats you to the punch. Midoriya Kuen may not be the most handsome boy in class, but he's easily the most confident and mature. So long as he doesn't turn out to be a secret scumbag, he's probably the best boyfriend material. Surprising nearly everyone present, Yairozu remarked, He certainly gives off a dependable aura. I would need to introduce him to my parents and grandfather, but I don't think they would oppose me dating him. Staring at Yairozu, as if she were some kind of strange creature, Jiro asked, Are your parents super strict or something? Introducing a boy to them is usually only something you do before marriage. Tilting her head to the side, Yairozu replied, But of course. Is there any meaning to dating a boy if you don't intend to marry them? It might seem a little early, but it never hurts to start preparing for your future in advance. Voicing the thought in everyone's minds, Ashido adopted a somewhat awkward smile as she asked, Could it be you come from a super wealthy family, Yairozu-san? Without hesitation, Yairozu nodded her head, revealing, Before there were restrictions implemented, to prevent the economy from destabilizing, my great-grandfather used his quirk to secure my family's position as one of the ten wealthiest in Japan. We have used that wealth to become one of the central pillars supporting the Hero Association, so it isn't incorrect to say my family is super wealthy. I hope that doesn't affect the way you view me from here on. My family aside, we all have the same aspiration of becoming heroes. Though many of them had suspected it based on Yairose's demeanor, the girls from class 1A now knew, 
for certain they were dealing with an Ajisama. Fortunately, unlike most of the super elite, Yairoza gave off a relatively approachable aura. It also wouldn't hurt to become friends with someone whose familial wealth measured in the trillions. So even without communicating, each of the girls present decided they would be good friends with Yairoza from then on. Seeing how close the girls were in the wake of their first lunch period, Izuku couldn't help wondering if something had transpired. Unfortunately, when he attempted asking Yairoza directly, she responded that it was a matter between the girls of Class 1A and that it wasn't proper for him to pry. Not wanting to complicate matters, Izuku promptly apologized and spent the remaining time before the bell chatting with Siro, Tokoyami, Mineta, and Shinso. The latter wasn't very sociable, undoubtedly due to the fact most people actively avoided talking to him, but he responded to most of Izuka's and the other boys' questions. The only thing he didn't reveal was the nature of his quirk. However, there was a very good reason for that. Nen, Hidusa Sinso, quirk, brainwashing, current level, 13, 21,309 EXP, effective level, 23, attributes strength, 14, agility, 20, vitality, 41, intelligence, 65, dexterity, 25, luck, 70, Though Shino's physical attributes weren't very impressive, barely above average, his intelligence, luck, and most importantly, his quirk were all phenomenal. Unfortunately, as the concept of brainwashing had a lot of negative connotations for good reasons, everyone who learned about his quirk automatically assumed he would become a villain. Thus, at least for the time being, Shinso intended to keep it a secret for as long as possible. Unfortunately, Fate had other ideas in mind as the door to the classroom abruptly slid open, followed by a booming voice shouting, I am here! While everyone else was excited by the appearance of All Might in his Silver Age costume, full body tights with a red top, blue bottom, a utility belt, predominantly golden boots and golden vambraces, Izuka's usual smile had frozen. By rejecting one for all, Izuku was hoping that All Might wouldn't be the teacher of Class 1, A's foundational hero studies course. Now that he had appeared, the probability of the USJ incident and other events transpiring increased drastically. Striking a pose at the front of the room, All Might shouted, Foundational Hero Studies, as the name suggests, this class focuses on teaching you everything you need to know to be a proper hero. As for our first lesson, Striking yet another pose, this time holding a placard with the word battle written on it, All Might declared, We'll be conducting a battle simulation, hearing they would be conducting battle training on the second day of school. A tense yet excited atmosphere pervaded the classroom. Things became especially exciting when All Might pressed the activation switch of a tiny remote, causing the far side wall of the classroom to slide open, revealing 20 numbers briefcases. To aid in your first battle, the school has prepared gear and costumes in accordance with the forms you filled out during your enrollment. In other words, these are your very first hero costumes. As not everyone had the means to acquire rare materials or develop high-quality costumes, the class practically erupted in response to All Might's words. Izuku was similarly excited, as he had put considerable effort into designing his hero costume, but it was hard to remain enthused when he knew his life would soon be imperiled. He wasn't completely unprepared, but even the best laid plans meant little in the face of true strength and inextricable violence. Interrupting Izuka's thoughts, All Might made a pointing gesture toward the door with his thumb, saying, Grab the briefcase matching your seat number, and then make your way to the field beta. You can change in the corresponding locker room. With that said, I'll see you there. Without waiting for anyone to respond, All Might bolted out of the room as if there was a fire. In the wake of his departure, everyone hurried to grab their assigned briefcases, the only exceptions between Izuku and Shinso. The latter didn't have a briefcase just yet, so he waited for everyone else to clear out before grabbing his gym uniform and following at a distance as the class made their way to field beta 
Contrasting the diverse and fairly flamboyant costumes of his classmates, Izuka's military-themed hero costume sacrificed flair for practicality and ease of movement. The top was a seemingly simple black tee, but it was woven from a special carbon fiber mesh that made it resistant to small arms fire and most blades. The bottom was made from the same material, but it resembled the standard issue fatigues of the JSDF, complete with cargo pockets. Complementing his outfit, Izuka wore a set of titanium-plated dog tags around his neck, heat-resistant combat gloves on his hands, and thick-soled combat boots on his feet. He also wore a red belt around his waist that came equipped with a magnetic belt buckle and a shortwave signal jammer. It could also serve as a tourniquet during an emergency, but that was a function Izuka hoped he would never have to utilize. Seeing Izuka's outfit, the nearby Kurishima couldn't help asking, is that really your hero costume? Don't get me wrong, it looks pretty badass, but isn't it a little too ordinary? Without missing a beat, Izuka tucked his dog tags into his shirt as he said, I prefer the term practical. Besides, soldiers, policemen, and firefighters are the original modern heroes. Paying homage to our roots never hurts. Well, when you put it that way, I dig it, said Kurishima, extending his right fist with a smile. Adopting a smile of his own, Izuku bumped Kurishima's fist with his own, saying, I'll see you on the battlefield, before making his way out of the locker room. One of the many benefits of a practical costume was that it was easy to change into, so he was among the first to finish getting changed. The only person who took less time was Ojiro, but his outfit was basically just a modified karate GI. Upon arriving at Field Beta, Izuka's green eyes briefly flickered as he noticed a pair of white shoes and distinctive blue gloves hovering in the air. While Ojiro was among the first to arrive, the absolute earliest was Hagakure. After all, her current hero costume was essentially just her removing her clothes not changing into something else. Seeing Izuku looking her way, a potent blush spread through Hagakure's invisible face as she slightly turned her body. She had mentally prepared herself to be seen in her hero costume, but it was still embarrassing to be stared at directly. Smiling wryly, Izuku decided against bothering Hagakure and instead made his way over to where All Might and Ojiro were standing, his eyes scanning the latter as he said, Nice costume. I take it you've undergone some traditional martial arts training. Nodding his head, Ojiro replied, Yeah. My family owns a dojo outside of Tokyo. My quirk may not be all that impressive, but I'm pretty confident in my strength and skill. Following Ojiro's response, All Might elected to comment on Izuka's outfit remarking, That's quite the practical costume. Young Midoriya. I'm a little surprised, though. Based on your performance during the entrance exam, I thought you would have incorporated more support items into your hero costume. Punching his right fist into the palm of his left hand, Izuku explained, I've changed quite a bit since then. I, I still plan to make use of support items in the future, but I'm currently focusing on my close combat and detainment skills. Recalling how Izuku had apprehended Bakugo, All Might gave a curt nod without pressing the matter further. He truthfully had a lot to discuss with Izuku, but now was neither the time nor the place. With All Might leaving them to their own devices, Izuku and Ojiro made casual conversation until the other students trickled in. Most of the girls wore form-fitting costumes that would bolster their popularity once they became heroes, while most of the guys wore edgy or flamboyant outfits that would allow them to stand out. Female heroes, especially attractive ones, had a much easier time earning fans and brand endorsements, so male hero costumes needed to be flashy or iconic to compete. Of course, none of that mattered if you were truly powerful. Waiting until everyone had arrived, All Might struck a pose with his hands on his hips as he said, They say the clothes make the pros, and behold, you are the proof of that claim. From this moment on, you are all officially heroes in training. Hearing someone like All Might call them heroes in training, the eyes of nearly everyone in class won a blazed with resolve. 
The former was the idol of almost every child in Japan, so even a small compliment from him was enough to get them pumped up. Feeding into everyone's excitement, All Might began explaining the details of their battle training. Simply put, they would be split into groups of two, one side playing the part of heroes, while the others were villains charged with protecting a fake nuclear bomb. If the heroes managed to touch the bomb before time ran out, they would be victorious. On the other hand, if the villains managed to incapacitate the heroes or stall until time ran out, they would be the victors. As things were developing similarly to canon, Izuku expected to be paired with Achiko, working together as a hero team. Instead, undoubtedly as a result of Bakugo being dropped from the class and Shinso being added, he ended up on a villain team with Ishido, prompting her to come over to him and remark, It looks like we're fated to be together, Midoriya Kuen, in a teasing tone. Though his mood wasn't the best due to All Might's appearance, Izuku managed a smile as he replied, If that's the case, I'm pretty lucky. You look amazing in your costume, by the way. Similar to the majority of female heroes, Ashido opted for a skin-tight bodysuit as the core of her hero costume. What distinguished her from the rest was her psychedelic camo pattern, blending bright turquoise and magenta in a way that was offensive to the eyes, yet compelled people to stare. Over that, she wore a yellow half vest with a thick fur collar, a white face mask that covered the upper half of her face, and dark purple boots with yellow accents. Adopting a broad smile, Ashido mused, You never pass on an opportunity to pay a girl a compliment, do you? Not that I'm complaining. I put a lot of effort into this design, and I'm pretty proud of my physique. Nodding his head, Izuku asserted, It shows. Before quickly changing the topic, adding, I also designed my hero costume. What do you think? Leaving Izuku a little speechless, Ashido replied, Eh, it's okay. Your body matches, but you don't really have the face of a rugged soldier type hero. Your face is too round, and your freckles aren't doing you any favors. As there was a fair amount of truth to Ishido's words, Izuku found himself unable to refute them. He had worked hard to cultivate a lean and athletic figure, but his face hadn't changed much since middle school. Cutting his hair had made a massive difference, but his face and bone structure made him look frustratingly young and naive. Exhaling a sigh, Izuku had a defeated expression and tone as he said, I believe honesty is important, but you could have sugar-coated your words a bit. This is the face I was born with, after all. There isn't much I can do to change it. Patting Izuku's shoulder, Ashido attempted to comfort him by saying, I didn't say it was a bad face. If anything, your face is pretty cute. It gives you a trustworthy vibe that makes you easy to approach. Though he didn't appreciate being called cute, Izuku ultimately shook his head and said, I'll take the compliment. Thanks, Ashido-san. Smiling even wider than usual, Ashido gave Izuku a few additional pats on his shoulder before suggesting, Come on, let's watch the other matches together and plan our strategy. My neta shouldn't be a problem, but Shoji Kuen's grip strength is insane. My quirk can't really be used against people directly, so you'll have to be the vanguard to fend him off. Nodding his head in affirmation, Izuku joined Ishido in watching the other matches. Deviating from canon, where Deku had to compete against Bakugo in the very first match, Izuku and Ishido wouldn't be participating until the third. This gave them plenty of time to strategize, even if the first match was guaranteed to be a bust. After all, it was a matchup between Todoroki and Tokoyami, representing the hero team, against Tsuyu and Siro as villains. Izuku would like to cheer for Tsuyu's victory, but he knew she had no hope against Todoroki's ice powers. At least she looked adorable while hibernating. With the first round ending with Todoroki's and Tokoyami's absolute victory, Izuku offered some consoling words to Siro and earned himself some brownie points by asking Yairozu if she could produce a warm blanket for Tsuyu. The latter was extremely susceptible to the cold, so she invariably collapsed after Todoroki used his ice powers to freeze the entire building. Siro, too distracted by her condition, 
was unable to fend off Tokoyami and his dark shadow, so the match ended after a mere 37 seconds. Fortunately, while the second match was also a little one-sided, it was marginally more interesting as Shinso was on the hero team, paired with Ojiro. When the two encountered the villain team, consisting of Kaminari and Koda, Shinso exploited his brainwashing quirk to take out the former in an instant. Koda lasted a little longer, as he seldom spoke aloud, but he was virtually powerless against Ojiro's assault since the only animals in the mock city were birds and a variety of insects. As a result, Shinso was able to casually walk around him, placing his hand on the rocket-shaped bomb and securing the hero team's victory in a modest 5 minutes and 13 seconds. With most of class 1, a having no idea what Shinso had done, tensions were high in the wake of the second round. Fortunately, All Might was present, garnering the class's attention with a barrel-chested laugh before exclaiming, that was an excellent performance by both the hero and villain teams. The hero team, in particular, deserves recognition for securing the payload and defeating their enemies without damaging their surroundings or causing needless harm. Well done! Though Kaminari, in particular, was still bothered by what had transpired during the exam, All Might's words had a decent effect on the rest of the class. Ida even started a short ovation, prompting several others to join in while All Might exhaled a hearty laugh in the background. After reaching the location of the bomb they needed to protect, a large room on the fifth floor of an office building, Ashido asked, What do you think our chances are? Do you think you'll be able to take on Shoji Kuen? Shaking his head, Izuku answered, I might be able to do something if he was simply strong but his quirk makes him a nightmare in close combat. Six hands are better than two. Maintaining a faint smile, Ashido asked, Does that mean we should just give up? Adopting a smile of his own, Izuku replied, Of course not. I may not be able to defeat Shoji Kuen in a contest of strength, at least not at my current level, but that isn't the objective. So long as we can stall for time, it's our victory. Nodding her head in approval, Ishido said, Okay, before asking, And how do you propose we do that? I can use my acid to block off all the entrances, but if the pH is too high, Shoji Kuen will just be able to break through it. If it's too low, it'll eat through the concrete. Punching his right fist into the palm of his left hand, Izuka mused, The solution is simple. This building has ten floors, and the hero team has no idea where the bomb is. It would be difficult to search every room within the time limit, so the smartest course of action is to face them directly or act like the bomb is on a different floor. I may not be as powerful as Shoji Kuen, but I'm confident in my stamina, speed, and durability. If it's just 10 minutes, I can easily stall him. Pumping her fists excitedly, Ashido's smile broadened as she exclaimed, Now you're talking! I hate sitting around and doing nothing, so let's take the fight to our opponents. Though he nodded in agreement, Izuka felt compelled to advise. Still, we should be careful. Mineta's stature and hero costume may make him look ridiculous, but he must have some tricks up his sleeve to get into the hero course. During the quirk apprehension test, I noticed that the grape-like balls he pulls from his head have powerful adhesive properties but he's able to bounce off of them. If he spreads them through our surroundings or manages to stick them to our bodies, things will get troublesome very quickly. Waving her hand in front of her face, Ashido assured, that won't be an issue. Just focus on Shoji Kuen and leave that little pipsqueak to me. I'll teach him a lesson on behalf of every girl in class. Our costumes may be designed to be admired, but taking advantage of his short stature to stare at girls, but is inexcusable. Since Ishido's quirk should be a direct counter to Mineta's, Izuku didn't question her decision. Instead, he extended his right fist, saying, Let's do this. With a toothy grin, Ishido readily bumped fists with them, and then the two of them made their way to the second floor to stage an ambush, though he silently bemoaned the fact he had been paired with Mineta. Shoji was looking forward to trading blows with Izuko. 
The latter had ranked second during the quirk apprehension test, so Shoji wanted to see how he, the person ranked seventh, compared. Interrupting Shoji's focus, Mineta, wearing a grape-themed bodysuit, large yellow gloves, oversized yellow boots, a yellow cape, and a pair of shorts that vaguely resembled a diaper asked, So, what do you think we should do, shoji Kun? If we knew where the bomb was, I could try scaling the building from the outside. Resisting the urge to tell Mineta to stay out of his way, Shoji spread his tentacle-like arms, interconnected by his extremely elastic flesh, to form the shape of a satellite dish. Then, using his ability to manifest body parts on the ends of his tentacles, he reproduced several ears to see if he could detect the location of Izuku and Ashido via sound. Without saying anything, Shoji began leading the way into the office-like complex. Mineta eventually followed after him, but only after balling his hands into fists and looking down at himself with a self-deprecating smile. Being expelled compelled him to reflect on his motivations and reconsider if he truly had what it took to become a hero. Being shunned by someone he was supposed to be cooperating with was surprisingly painful. Unaware of Mineta's thoughts, Shoji used his excellent hearing to pinpoint Azuka's and Ashido's locations on the second floor. He couldn't make out what they were saying, but they seemed to be talking to each other in the same room. Speaking for the first time since the start of the operation, Shoji revealed, I've located them, in a deep, somewhat raspy voice. Then, recalling Mineta's previous suggestion, he proposed, you should try and find a way to sneak in from behind while I draw their attention from the front. Realizing that Shoji was giving him a chance, Mineta briefly became teary-eyed before quickly wiping away the evidence, giving a thumbs-up gesture and responding, Just leave it to me! He was a little ashamed that he immediately thought about how sneaking in from behind would let him get a view of Ishido's backside, but it wasn't like he could change his entire personality in a single evening. With their plan decided, Shoji waited around a minute or so for Mineta to sneak outside before smashing through the doors leading to Azuka's and Ashido's locations. The two were chatting casually while the latter sat on the edge of an office desk. So Shoji hastily grabbed a cuckle partition, using it as a makeshift shield as he charged toward them like a bulldozer. You sure took your sweet time, hero! shouted Ishido, leaping backward to create some distance while Izuku bolted forward, surprising Shoji as he didn't expect the former to try and meet him head on. Taking advantage of the fact that Shoji had limited both his vision and movement by picking up a shield, Izuku performed a leaping dropkick, his feet impacting the direct center of the partition. Shoji's momentum was greater than his, but the effects of Bronze's body allowed Izuku to endure the collision as his feet buried into Shoji's diaphragm. Though Izuku's dropkick knocked the wind out of him, causing his torso to seize, Shoji didn't let his charge go to waste. The moment he realized Izuku's aim, he released his grasp on the partition, allowing it to shatter against his body as he spread his webbed arms wide with the very clear intent of capturing his opponent. He would have succeeded as well if not for the fact that Izuku had planned ahead using Shoji's solid frame as a springboard to propel himself away, just as his muscular classmate's arms tried closing around him. Landing on his feet, Izuku's smile exhibited traces of euphoria and battle lust as he shouted, Sorry, Shoji Kuen, but this match belongs to me. Can't have you embarrassing me in front of my future date. With Shoji being forced to a knee due to his winded state, Izuku leaped over his body and followed up, with a shoulder tackle. Shoji's inordinately flexible limbs allowed him to protect his front and back with similar ease. But even with the disparity in their sizes, Izuka's momentum was greater than his inertia. When the latter crashed into him, Shoji felt a sharp pain in his limbs as he was sent flying a short distance, crashing through several partitions and smashing an office desk. Though his previous life's training mandated, that he followed up to ensure his opponent was down for good, Izuku created some distance between himself and the downed Shoji. His goal was to confirm the results of his training and by time, not brutalize one of his classmates. 
so Izuka didn't mind giving the six-armed man a chance to recover. In the meantime, he inspected his and Shoji's statuses, the former to confirm he was gaining a fair amount of experience, and the latter to ascertain whether a person's attributes changed mid-combat. Name. Izuka Midoriya. Quirk. Digitalization. Current level. 16. 53,993 to 54,108 EXP. Effective level. 33. Attribute Strength. 50. Agility. 50. Vitality. 100. Intelligence. 62. Dexterity. 50. Luck. 15. Free Attributes. 0. Rerolls available. 2. Perks. Bronze Skin. Fleet Footed. Lesser Regeneration. Healthy Body. Sharp Mind. Nimble Fingers. Nem. Nitosoye. Quirk. Dupli Arms. Current Level. 20. 147,100 EXP. Effective Level. 48. Attribute Strength. 137 to 130. Agility. 29 to 11. Vitality. 190 to 169. Intelligence. 28. Dexterity. 63 to 25. Luck. 35. Seeing that most of Shoji's physical attributes had taken a hit, Izuka's green eyes blazed. He had observed a similar phenomenon in the past, specifically when taking self-defense classes, but the injuries sustained during spars were astronomically different from actual combat. Now, he knew with absolute certainty that a person's attributes varied based on quirk usage and the condition of their bodies. Observing Izuka's and Shoji's battle from a short distance away, Ashido couldn't help thinking. Midoriya-kun is more capable than I expected. If it's true, he only started training seriously two years ago. He must be some kind of genius. Though quirks could make a person stronger, faster, and more perceptive, battle awareness and combat proficiency could only be acquired through experience. Ashido was confident in her abilities because she had trained extensively and taken dance classes since she was four. Because of this, she could tell Izuku wasn't a beginner. He couldn't be called a master, but his movements and relative calm alluded to a fair amount of experience in actual combat. After making a mental note to probe more into Izuku's past during their date, Ashido stopped watching his fight and scanned her surroundings. Mineta had yet to appear, so she was starting to consider the possibility he had separated from Shoji to search for the bomb. This was within the scope of possibilities listed out by Izuku, but that didn't make her any less annoyed, as it was clear that Izuku had things under control. Ashido waved her arm and called out to him, shouting, Yo, Midoriya Kuin, I'm going to make sure that little pervert doesn't stumble across the bomb by accident. You good here? Without taking his eyes from the still-down Shoji, Izuku gave a thumbs-up gesture and replied, See you after we win, in a relaxed tone. His eyes were still blazing, but one of the first things he learned in BCT was to stay calm, stick to his training, and trust his companions. Ashido wasn't a child that required his oversight. More importantly, her physical attributes were far higher than Mineta's. Even if the latter managed to surprise her, Ashido should be able to beat the shit out of him without breaking a sweat. Though he had trained hard leading up to his enrollment in UA, Shoji had never fought a serious battle where neither he nor his opponent held their punches. Actual combat was more intense and significantly more painful than he expected. Ignoring his body's protests, Shoji slowly pushed himself to a kneeling position, his obsidian black eyes fixating on the nearby Izuku as he asserted, You're strong, through the veil of his balaclava-like face mask. Shaking his head, Izuku cracked a smile as he said, Not as strong as you. This outcome is the result of a difference in experience and conviction. If you truly wish to hurt me, those powerful arms of yours could probably make me into a meatball. That's one of the burdens of being a hero. We're obligated to hold back, even when our enemies intend to kill us. Rising to his full height, Izuku dusted himself off as he added, 
Not that I disagree with this way of doing things. Heroes exist to inspire and protect, not pass judgment. Now get to your feet and come at me. So long as you limit yourself to punching and kicking, I should be able to endure your full strength. Blinking in surprise, Shoji asked, Are you sure? I don't mean to brag, but I can bench press 2,000 kilograms if I use all of my arms. If I seriously injured one of my classmates, I don't think I would be able to become a hero. Instead of responding to Shoji's words, Izuka peeled off his chainmail-like shirt and tossed it to the side, revealing a lean yet incredibly well-defined physique that earned him a bit of fanfare among the spectators. That was one of the reasons he removed his shirt, but the main reason was to show off the effects of his bronze skin. With Shoji staring at him in confusion, Izuku slapped the center of his chest with all his strength. Doing so produced an exceptionally loud sound, but it also caused the entire front of his body to turn a luminous shade of bronze. Did you see that? asked Izuku. I may not be as durable as Kurishima Kuen, but I can disperse forces across my body. Unless you're hiding a gun or a knife somewhere, you won't be able to break my defenses easily. Though he was more than a little confused, Shoji only hesitated for a brief period before getting into a boxing stance and saying, Let's do this, in a resolute tone. In response to Shoji's words, Izuka launched himself at the much taller boy, executing a flying leg kick. Strength and agility were complementary attributes, so the power of his kicks was much stronger than his punches. His maximum speed may not increase as his strength rises, but he could leap greater distances and kick off the ground to accelerate much faster. Caught off guard by Izuku's surprise attack, Shoji barely had time to cross his arms before the former's heel impacted his guard with the force of a cannon. He managed to stay upright, but his feet scraped against the ground as he was pushed back nearly three meters, impacting a wall. Not giving Shoji any time to recover, Izuku attacked, this time executing a simple side kick, but much faster than any ordinary karate ka. The wall behind Shoji was the exterior wall of the building, so Izuku was planning to kick him out and take the fight to the street. That way, they would both be able to move freely. Interrupting Izuka's plan, Shoji used his tentacles as a spring to abruptly repel himself from the wall. At the same time, he tried to grab Izuka's leg with his left hand while punching outward with his right. Not expecting Shoji to lurch forward without any forecasting movements, Izuka barely managed to twist his head and torso to evade the former's punch. This consequently allowed Shoji to grab onto his leg, but that was something Izuku had anticipated the moment he launched his attack. The moment Shoji's arm wrapped around his foreleg like a vice, Izuka tucked his body inward, coiling himself like a spring before straightening out with explosive force. As powerful as he was, Shoji's speed and reaction time were lacking. He was also severely lacking in experience, so the tensions in his body had relaxed, albeit only for a moment, when he caught Izuka's leg. As a result, his mind failed to comprehend what had transpired when Izuka suddenly exploded, sending his body smashing through the concrete wall behind him. Fortunately, though Shoji would have been fine either way, he was only on the second floor when Izuka kicked him outside. He also managed to flip himself over at the last moment, saving himself an intimate introduction to the asphalt. Following close behind, Izuka leaped from the second floor, executing a flawless three-point hero landing as he fell to ground level. This caused a sharp pain to spread through his knee, but it faded almost instantly due to his digitalized body and the diffusion effect of bronze skin. Rising to his feet, Izuka took a moment to dust himself off, asking, Can you keep going? In an intentionally casual tone. He was supposed to be playing the part of a villain right now, so he decided to play it up a bit for the viewers. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Shoji responded by hurtling chunks of destroyed building at him. They weren't particularly fast, and Izuku was more than capable of withstanding the forces they contained, but having head-sized pieces of concrete fly at his face was fairly unnerving. 
forcing him to raise his guard. Taking advantage of the momentary gap in Izuka's preparedness, Shoji charged forward as his feet could carry him. Then, as if borrowing a page from the former, he tackled Izuku through the building, crashing through several walls before eventually tripping over, feeling himself falling backward. Izuku gripped Shoji's body, tucked his legs, and rolled with the fall. He was currently blind due to some concrete dust getting in his eyes, but he still managed to execute a flawless tomonage, one of the traditional throws of judo. The result was that Shoji was sent flying through the air, allowing Izuka the opportunity to bound to his feet and create some distance between them. While trying to clear his vision, Izuku adopted a wry smile and remarked, That was one hell of a tackle, Shoji Koen. Hearing Izuku's words, Shoji, who was currently half embedded in a wall, groaned, Speak for yourself. Before asking, Was that judo? After a brief silence, nodding his head, Izuku was about to answer when the sound of a bull horn interrupted them, followed by All Might exclaiming, And that's the end of round three, over the building's intercom. Fortunately, just as Izuku was panicking internally, All Might added, The villain team managed to hold out until time expired, so they're the victors. Hearing the relieving news, Izuku exhaled a loud and exhausted sigh. He had gotten so caught up in the moment that he completely lost track of time. Fortunately, as he would later learn, Ashido has no issues dealing with Mineta. Her acid was able to counteract the properties of Mineta's grape shot. So it was nearly as one-sided as the fight between Ojiro and Koda. Now that their battle was over, Izuku made his way over to Shoji, pulling him from the wall and helping him stand as the two made their way out of the building. It was a little awkward due to Shoji being bulkier and a full 20 centimeters taller than him, but the act of sportsmanship earned him a round of applause and several approving remarks once they reunited with the rest of the class. While Class 1A was in the middle of their battle training, two people were observing the exercise with very different expressions. The first, Principal Nizu, had an approving smile on his mouse-like face, while the second, Katsuki Bakugo, wore a grim, almost pouty expression. As if he didn't notice Bakugo's displeasure, Nizu asked, So, what do you think, Bakugo-kun? Do you still believe Midoriya Kuen is undeserving of his position in Class 1A? Instead of answering Nizu's question, Bakugo hung his head, no longer able to look at the monitor they had been using to observe Azuka's and Shoji's brawl. He already knew Izuku was qualified after witnessing his performance and seeing the results of the quirk evaluation test. What he couldn't understand was how Izuku had gone from a loser that couldn't even meet a girl's gaze to someone who exuded confidence as if it were his default state of mind. It was almost like he was a completely different person. Seeing through Bakugo's thoughts, Niza's voice was utterly calm and relaxed as he said, It is becoming increasingly well documented that a person's quirk can have a drastic effect on their mentality. As someone who grew up alongside Midoriya Kuen, he must seem completely different from the boy you once knew. However, that isn't what it's important right now. The real question is, are you serious about becoming a hero, or was it simply an excuse to show off? Furrowing his brows, Bakugo flared up, exclaiming, What kind of question is that? Of course, I want to be a hero, and not just any hero. I'm going to be the greatest hero of all time. Even greater than all might. Instead of panicking or trying to refute Bakugo's words, Nizu gave a slight nod, waiting for the former to settle down before asking, Then let me ask you this, Katsuki Bakugo-kun. What does being a hero mean to you? Without missing a beat, Bakugo thumped his chest and replied, It means being the strongest, strong enough to save anyone and fierce enough to deter any wannabe villain from showing their ugly mug in public. Seeing a strange emotion in Bakugo's chest, Nizu revealed an expression he had rarely witnessed when interacting with adults, disappointment. It was even worse when the latter shook his head and said, while strength is important, especially when it comes to protecting people, it isn't power that deters villains and compels people to admire heroes. 
If that were all that was necessary, the JSDF and the police force would do a better job at keeping the peace than a handful of heroes. Meeting Bakugo's gaze, Niza's expression and tone were severe as he explained, The reason heroes are so integral to our modern society is because they inspire others, especially the younger generations of Quirk users, to be good to be better. If the only thing you know how to inspire is fear, it doesn't matter how many people you save, you will never be the number one hero. As virtually everyone had lauded his power and reinforced the notion he could be an exceptional hero, Bakugo found himself at a loss for words in response to Niza's declaration. If it were some random person, he would have scoffed and told them to piss off. However, the man in front of him was the principal of the most prestigious hero academy, not just in Japan, but the entire world. He wasn't some loser that had no idea what he was saying. Reinforcing Bakugo's silence, Nizu went on to say, If Midoriya Kuen had elected to press charges against you for yesterday's incident, your path to becoming a hero would have been severed right then and there. Even if you regretted your conduct and worked tirelessly to prove you had been reformed, you would never be entrusted with a professional hero license. If you still aspired to become a hero, your only option would have been to become a vigilante. However, as your quirk is exceptionally rare and very easy to identify, you would quickly be apprehended and incarcerated for illegal quirk usage. Looking away from Bakugo, Nizi used a remote to rewind to the scene of class, one egg clapping as Izuku arrived, supporting his former enemy on his shoulder. When Bakugo eventually looked up, staring at the image on the screen, he regained his smile and said, You truly do have the potential to be a great hero. Bakugo Kuen, don't just take my word for it. These are the words of Midoriya Kuen as well. Despite everything you've done, that child doesn't hate you. Instead, he actively tries to convince others you're not a bad person. He also believes that it's only a matter of time before you rejoin the Department of Heroes. So allow me to ask one more time, are you serious about becoming a hero? As if the fact they had been ignoring him all day was a distant memory. Tsuyu and Achiko approached Izuku shortly after All Might was finished evaluating their performance. Touching her chin, Tsuyu, wearing a predominantly green, frog-themed bodysuit with goggles, remarked, You really gave it your all, didn't you, Izuku-chan? Pumping her fists excitedly, Achiko, wearing a form-fitting pink and blue bodysuit, oversized pink boots, pink wrist accessories, and a utility belt added, I know, right? That was totally awesome. Uh, I'm pumped up just thinking about it. Adopting a somewhat wry smile, Izuku, still shirtless, replied, Thanks, Sachiko-san, Tsuyu-chan. I appreciate the compliment. Unfortunately, I still have a ways to go before I can call myself a pro. If I hadn't lowered my guard trying to show off, I wouldn't be in such a miserable condition. Though he hadn't sustained any serious injuries, Izuku was looking a bit worse for wear, his hair and body covered in a mixture of sweat, dust, and concrete fragments. He was fairly used to being dirty, but it felt awkward chatting with two girls while he looked like shit. Exhibiting a surprising lack of shame, Tsuyu gave Izuka's body more than a cursory glance before remarking, Your condition doesn't seem too bad. That thing that makes your body all shiny must be pretty effective, Ribbit. But I'm a little confused. Didn't you say your quirk was related to boosting your strength, speed, and intellect? Suppressing his feeling of awkwardness, Izuka nodded his head and gave his chest a light smack as he explained, This is one of the side effects of increasing my strength beyond a certain threshold. It would disappear if I shifted my focus to something else. Reaching the obvious conclusion, Tsuyu asked, Does that mean you gain other effects by shifting your focus? Though a number of his classmates were listening in on the conversation, Izuku didn't hesitate to answer, that's right. If I focus on enhancing my speed, my legs are strengthened, and my feet can stick to surfaces more easily. If I really push myself, I can even run across water or scale walls a certain distance. Blinking in surprise, Tsuyu voiced the opinion of nearly everyone present, stating, That's incredible. Your quirk is a lot more versatile 
than I initially thought, Ribbit. I'm envious. Shifting the focus away from him, Izuku retorted, The quirks I'm envious of are Akakosans and Todoroki Koans, giving objects the properties of zero gravity and being able to freeze over an entire building is incredible. Recalling her defeat at the hands of the latter, Tsuyu hung her head and became a little downcast. At the same time, Achiko exhaled a nervous laugh, rubbing the back of her head as she said, My quirk isn't anything to be envious of. It's super useful in certain situations, but it isn't as flashy or cool as an emission or enhancement type quirk. If I'm unlucky, I could be spending my entire career as a sidekick. Resisting the urge to explain how batshit crazy overpowered, even the weakest form of gravity manipulation was, Izuka smiled broadly and said, You're too hard on yourself, Achiko-san. We haven't known each other for long, but I can tell you're kind-hearted and have a persevering spirit. All you really lack is confidence. Once you realize how truly amazing you are, nothing can stop you from becoming a pro. Not expecting such heavy praise, Achiko's face blushed bright red as a sudden urge to run away swelled within her chest. Fortunately, she wasn't alone, allowing her a chance to collect herself as Tsuyu gazed up at Izuku and advised, you should consider toning it down a bit. Izuka-chan, even if you're being 100% sincere, it comes off as disingenuous when you praise people too much, Ribbit. Scratching the back of his head, Izuka defaulted to the tried and true method of easing tensions through self-depreciation expressing, sorry, Tsuchan Achiko-san. Before enrolling in UA, I rarely had the chance to speak with girls other than my Ka-chan. This is all kind of new to me, so I apologize if it seems like I'm laying it on a little thick. It's just that all the girls in our class are super amazing. This is the UA High Hero course, after all. Caro, looking as though she had received critical damage, Tsuyu surprised Izuku by abruptly walking away. Things became especially awkward when Achiko smiled bashfully and followed after her. But at least Izuku wasn't left completely alone. Immediately following the duo's departure, Kaminari and Kirishima approached him, patting his shoulders as they said, You had a good run, and better luck next time, with looks of sympathy that were undermined by the glimmers of amusement in their eyes. After a surprisingly exhausting day, Izuku was seriously considering just going home after waiting nearly an hour outside Yue's front gate. Ashido had said she would meet him there after she took care of something, but the sky was beginning to darken and she still hadn't shown up. Fortunately, while he was a little annoyed, Izuku had plenty of thoughts to occupy his mind. After all, if things continued to develop as they were, the USJ incident would be occurring the following day. With more than two years to prepare, Izuku had considered hundreds, if not thousands, of methods to prevent the events in canon from getting out of hand. He may have only watched up to the fifth or sixth season of the anime, but that afforded him more than enough knowledge to alter the flow of events in a favorable direction. At the very least, he wouldn't allow his favorite rabbit-themed hero to lose an arm and a leg. Interrupting Izuka's thoughts, Ashido finally arrived, waving her hand and calling out to him as she ran over. Stopping once she reached Izuka's side, Ashido bent over, placing her hands on her knees and struggling to catch her breath. Notably, unlike the other students passing through the gate, she wasn't wearing the gray blazer associated with their school. Instead, she was wearing the red tie and white dress shirt worn underneath allowing keen-eyed observers to see the outline of her bra and the faint pink hue of her skin. Though he couldn't help taking notice of these two features, Izuka took care to ensure his gaze didn't wander as he asked, Is everything okay, Ishido-san? I appreciate that you ran all this way, but I would have kept waiting even if you took another hour or two. Instead of responding to Izuka's question, Ashido exhaled an exhausted chuckle and focused on trying to catch her breath. She had originally only planned to keep Izuku waiting around 15 minutes, but she got carried away conversing with the other girls. Then, on her way over, she realized her body was perspiring quite a bit due to their afternoon training. So she ran over to the showers, gave herself a quick scrub, 
and changed into her backup uniform before rushing over nearly an hour late, catching Ishido a little off guard. Izuku extended her a bottle of water he had pulled from his backpack. He generally carried several bottles and a fully stocked first aid kit for emergencies, so he had plenty to spare as he said, Here, take this, Ishido-san. It's a bottle of alkaline water with a pH level of 9.5. It may be a little warm since it's been sitting in my backpack, but the flavor is better than conventional tap or mineral water. Accepting the bottle, Ashido jokingly asked, What are you a boy scout who carries bottled water around in their backpack instead of a tumbler? Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku answered, Someone who doesn't want to feel helpless if they encounter a young child or an elderly citizen suffering from heat stroke? Rolling her eyes, Ashido removed the bottle's lid and downed its contents in a single go. She was surprised by how fresh it tasted, but she didn't comment on it, returning the empty bottle to Izuku as she said, Thanks, Midoriya-kun, that really hit the spot. Now, how about we get this party started? The cafe I mentioned closes around 6.30, so we'll need to hurry if we want to make it. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Ashido grabbed his arm like an over-affectionate girlfriend, intentionally brushing her breasts against him with a bright and cheerful smile. Contrasting Ashido's expectations, a slight frown marred Izuka's face as he said, This may be a date, but I don't think we're close enough to walk together in such a lovey-dovey fashion. At least not yet, though he didn't really mind it. Izuku could tell Ashido was attempting to goad him. It may have worked, if he was a legitimate 15-year-old, but he wasn't some inexperienced brat. He was also secretly holding out for a real woman, examples being Midnight, Mirko, or MT Lady, so it would take more than a bit of skinship and playful flirting to move him. Loosing her hold on Azuka's arm but not releasing it completely, Ashido narrowed her eyes and teased. Wow, look at you, so mature. Instead of refuting the assertion, Izuka gave an affirming nod and asked, Now where is the cafe? Since you seem determined to cling to me, I may as well escort you properly. Turning her eyes up with an expression that seemed to ask, Are you for real? Ashido replied, It's not too far from the station, around a block or two south. I'll give directions as we go. Hearing Ashido mention that their destination was south of the station, Izuka's eyes briefly narrowed. Said area was riddled with love hotels and other recreational facilities. If members of Yue's body were seen there, it would adversely affect the school's reputation. It was no wonder Ishido had forgotten her blazer. This dumbass, thought Izuku, even as he followed Ishido's directions to a T. He could simply refuse if she attempted to invite him somewhere compromising, so there was no harm in playing along. Rather, if things did develop in that direction, he could reinforce the notion he wasn't a hungry wolf that would jump at the first opportunity to feed his urges. He held out against Inko, so there was no way he would succumb to a brat with more bravado than sense. Though Izuku was correct in thinking that Ishido was steering him in the direction of Mizutafa's version of a red light district. The cafe she had in mind was located on the periphery just outside the accepted boundary of the region. It was the type of place people invited their boyfriends or girlfriends to when they wanted to take their relationship to the next level, but lacked the courage to suggest it directly. As a result, the atmosphere within the cafe was palpably tense as Izuku and Ishido sat in a tiny booth intended for couples. Exhibiting the same sense of unease as someone utilizing the cafe for its intended purpose, Ashido sat close enough to Izuku that her thigh grazed against his as she asked. So, what do you think? Pretty interesting place, huh? Instead of immediately responding to Ashido's question, Izuku scanned their surroundings, inspecting every last person present, before turning his gaze to the visibly nervous Pinkette and replying, I imagine it would be a nice place to visit if, and when we get a little closer. For now, I think we're both out of our element, Exhaling an uncharacteristically nervous chuckle, Ashido admitted, You know, I think you may be right. The atmosphere is a lot tenser than I was expecting. Nodding in agreement, Izuka said, 
then there's no reason to hesitate. Let's get out of here. Rising to his feet, Izuku extended his hand to help Ashido do the same. Their actions drew the gazes of several people, but as they had more to worry about than some random high school students, most looked away fairly quickly. As such, rather than falling into a trap, Izuku ended up in a situation where Ashido was the one embarrassed and forced to thank him when he lent her his blazer. After getting a decent distance from the cafe and the periphery of the red light district, Ashido abruptly threw up her hands and exclaimed, Ah, that was so intense! in an enthusiastic but markedly relieved tone. Turning to Izuku, a broad smile developed across Ashido's face as she added, You know, you're a pretty good guy, Midoriya Koen. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why I suspected otherwise. I guess it's because you don't really act like a boy around our age. Instead of commenting on Ashido's remark, Izuku raised his brows and asked, Does this mean our date is over? I was kind of looking forward to hanging out with you. I mean, this is the first time I've ever accompanied a cute girl like this. It would be a shame to end things early. Pointing directly at Azuka's face, Ashido exclaimed, You see? That's exactly what I'm referring to. What kind of middle-turned high schooler talks like that? Shrugging his shoulder, Izuka responded, One who is polite and cares about how people perceive him? We are aspiring to be pro-heroes, after all. Exhaling an exasperated sigh, Ashido visibly deflated, hanging her arms and slumping her shoulders at the sheer insensibility of Azuka's rationale. He was right, of course, but it just sounded so weird to hear a boy around her age speak with such level-headedness. Shaking her head, Ashido regained a bit of vigor as she asked, Can I ask you something? You said something along the lines of always doing your best to be honest. So let me ask you this. What kind of girls do you prefer? Even if it's true that you think we're all cute, you must have a preference. Nodding his head, Izuku calmly remarked, Honesty is the best policy. Before answering, when it comes to physical appearances, I'm honestly not all that picky. What I do prefer are strong and mature girls who are passionate about something they love and know precisely what they want from a relationship. In other words, I'm looking for someone I can treat as a friend and an equal. Hearing Izuka's response, Ashido couldn't help massaging her forehead as she remarked, Is this guy for real? Under her breath. A normal boy would have hesitated or responded by vaguely listing off the features of the girl he was with. Izuka's answer exuded sincerity, but it was way too serious for a typical high schooler. Noticing Ishido's obvious exasperation, a faint smile developed across Izuka's face as he asked, Should I have answered by saying I like girls with amazing physiques, pink skin, and badass eyes? Because it wouldn't be a lie. Looking up to meet Izuka's gaze, a hint of incredulity briefly flashed across Ishido's distinctive gold and black scara eyes. Then... Regaining her usual smile, she affirmed, It's certainly better than your previous response. But you forgot to mention my horns. Do you not like them? On the contrary, replied Izuku. I just didn't think it would be appropriate to say I like horny women. Though it was nearly indistinguishable due to her complexion, a blush developed through Ashido's cheeks when she heard Izuku's surprisingly brazen response. With how over-the-top and polite his other responses were, she didn't think he had it in him to flirt properly. Unable to contain a smile, Ashido gave Izuku a weak shove as she said, You dog, in an embarrassed but slightly gratified tone. Even if Izuku's words were superficial lip service or simple ribbing, they made her heart beat a little quicker. After parting ways with Mina at the station, Izuku was in an excellent mood the rest of the way home. Ashido had given him her number and permission to address her informally, so the two exchanged texts late into the evening while Izuku mulled over his plans for the following day. Because of the rapport he had built with Nizu and All Might, Izuku was fairly certain he could persuade them to prepare countermeasures, even if he didn't reveal the specific details of what might happen. Fortunately, he had experimented in the past by increasing each of his attributes to 100, 
so he had a reasonable excuse to offer. By increasing his luck to 100, Izuku's system rewarded him with a perk called Intuition. As the name implied, it gave him a sixth sense of sorts. Unfortunately, even though it was a perk obtained at 100 luck, it wasn't very reliable. Izuku had tried using it to game the stock market, but only around half his investments paid off. He had a much higher success rate by simply paying attention to the news and analyzing market trends, so he gave up on intuition until he had spare attributes to pump into luck. Luckily for Izuku, Nizu, or anyone else, could see his current distribution of attributes. He also wouldn't be lying when he said he suspected an incident might happen, so even someone as brilliant as Nizu shouldn't be able to see through him. Beyond that, Izuku's true concern was whether the presence of additional teachers would positively or negatively impact the outcome of the incident. As the first Noma to appear in Boku no Hero Academia was designed to counteract All Might, the presence of additional teachers may very well lead to a massacre. Izuku doubted the Nomu was anywhere near level 60,000, but he should possess superhuman strength and agility along with the shock absorption and super regeneration quirks. Normal heroes would be completely powerless against it. So Izuku spent much of the evening deliberating the best course of action before simply sending Principal Nizu an email detailing his concerns. Early the following day, Nearly as soon as Izuka broke through the mob-like group of reporters surrounding the front gate, a voice informing him to report to the principal's office sounded over the school's PA system. Upon reaching Nisa's office, Izuka was asked to take a seat before the mouse-like dog-bear hybrid said, I apologize for calling you here on such short notice, Midori Akuin. I thought to send you an email, but I preferred to discuss matters related to the school's security in person. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, Please don't apologize, Principal Nizu. If anything, I should be thanking you. My intuition is far from perfect, so it's entirely possible I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. Raising his oversized, paw-like hand, Nizu firmly asserted, I would never ignore the concerns of one of my students, especially when said concerns involve the safety and well-being of the entire student body. I also regard you as a trustworthy individual, so I don't believe you would send such an email unless you were fairly certain something would occur. Punctuating his words, Nizu brought up a holographic display depicting a dome-like structure with the words unforeseen simulation joint hovering in the air. For tomorrow's foundational hero studies course, Class 1A was scheduled to conduct rescue training at this facility. Our world-renowned unforeseen simulation joint or USJ for short. Since it would be, mind the pun, fairly disastrous if an incident were to occur at such an important facility, I have privately conveyed your concerns to the supervising teachers and several of the more members of the security department. That includes All Might. So please, put your mind at ease and focus on your classes. Feeling genuinely relieved by Niza's words, Izuku adopted a broad smile and replied, Thanks. Principal Nizu, I still have the impression something will happen, but if the level 60,000 All Might is present, I can't imagine it will be difficult to resolve. Blinking his somewhat beady black eyes, a very human smile developed across Nizu's face as he said, Well, if there's nothing else, please be on your way. Rising to his feet, Izuku lowered his head and thanked Nizu one last time before leaving, unaware that he had just passed the former's test. Most of what Nizu had just said were half-truths. He was skeptical and somewhat paranoid by nature, so he experimented to see if Izuka's words were truly the result of intuition or something else. In other words, by pointing out he still felt as though something was amiss, Izuku had convinced Nizu he wasn't simply talking out of his ass. As Izuku had reached the campus around 15 minutes before the bell, Homeroom was already in full swing by the time he arrived. Fortunately, today was the day they were nominating their class representative, so it didn't matter if he was a little late. At the very least, Aizawa didn't even say anything as he entered the classroom. Though virtually everyone noticed Izuka's arrival, the person to call out to him was Mina. 
raising her hand and shouting, It's about time you showed up, Izuka Kuin! We're trying to decide if you should be the representative or vice representative of the class. Raising his brows, Izuku ignored the varied stares he was receiving from some of his male classmates, making his way over to the all-female group to ask, What's this about, Minasan? I don't recall volunteering for either position, spreading her hands and shrugging in a gesture of mock helplessness. Mina explained, What can you do? Aizawa Sensei said we needed to pick our class representatives before homeroom ended. Ida Kuen suggested we put it to a vote, but just about everyone voted for themselves. You're the only boy that received more than one vote, so you and Yairozasen need to decide which of you is in charge. Piggybacking off of Mina's words, Yairozu revealed, I personally cast my vote for you, Midoriya Kuen, so I don't mind if you want to take the lead representative position. I'm still lacking in many ways, so I was frankly a little surprised to receive two votes. And how many did I receive? Asked Izuku, genuinely curious to know the answer. Anticipating Izuku's question, Mina held up five fingers and revealed, You received a whopping five votes. One was your vote, as we assumed you would nominate yourself. While the remaining four came from Yairozasan, Yuraraka san Suchan, and Shoji Kuen. On that note, you're free to change your vote, but it wouldn't change the fact you receive the most out of everyone here. Instead of opposing his nomination, Izuku adopted a smile, passing his gaze over Achiko, Tsuyu, Yairozu, and the nearby Shoji as he said, Thank you for the votes of confidence. I would have nominated Ida Kuen and Yairoza san for the positions, but if this is the result of diplomacy, I'll accept the result with humility. Fixing his gaze on Yairozu, Izuko added, That being said, I believe you should take the class representative position, Yairozu san. I'm better at logistics and administrative tasks than leading people directly, so you can leave all the forms and paperwork to me. Of course, if you ever need my help directing people, I'll be happy to assist. Though she was a little surprised when Izuka said he would have cast his vote for her. Yairozu recovered quickly, a wide smile developing across her face as she said, Thank you, Midoriya Kuen. I shall do my best to meet both your and the class's expectations. As he was listening in on the conversation from his sleeping back, lying on the ground behind the teacher's podium, Aizawa rose to his feet and said, Then that settles it. Momo Yairozu will be the class representative, and Izuka Midoriya will be the vice class representative. Get up here and give your introductions. After that, you can have self-study for the rest of homeroom. I have a staff meeting to attend. As he was one of the teachers that would be chaperoning class 1A during the following day's rescue training, Aizawa had already received a yellow alert from Nizu informing him to come by the principal's office. Yellow was just two steps down from the worst case scenario. So Aizawa had a serious expression as he departed the classroom taking off at his maximum speed the moment the door closed behind him. Following homeroom, the students of class 1A had math with ectoplasm, modern literature with cementos, English with present mic, and most of the boys' favorite course, modern art history with 18 plus hero midnight. Name, Namuri Kiyama. Quirk, Somnambulist. Current level, 25, 593,337 EXP. Effective level, 38. Attribute strength, 29. Agility, 33. Vitality, 108. Intelligence, 68. Dexterity, 47. Luck, 103. As her hero name suggested, Midnight, also known as Namiri Kiyama, was a heroine who had embraced the more sensual aspects of being a female pro. She had long, spiky black hair and her costume was inspired by comprised of a thin white bodysuit, a breastless black leotard, high-heeled boots, and purple stockings fastened by a garter belt. She also wore cuff-like manacles and a red-eye mask. But most people didn't even notice the latter as they were too distracted by Midnight's mature, fit, and incredibly curvaceous body. Altogether, she looked more like a dominatrix than a proper hero, complete with a red leather whip. 
With UA having a policy that mandated teachers wear their costumes while teaching, Midnight's modern art history lessons were as riveting as they were informative. This was especially true for Zuko, but as he was currently trying to cultivate rapport with the girls in his class, he kept his gaze from wandering even when Midnight walked right by him. Her perky, tantalizingly round, jot swaying in a way that demanded attention. Following Midnight's modern art history lesson, Class 1A, alongside the rest of the school, had lunch from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Mina extended Izuku an invitation to sit with the girls, but he politely declined since it would set a dangerous precedent. He also really needed some friends he could hit the gym or spar with, so he ended up sitting with Shoji, Ojiro, and Sato as part of a larger group of boys. Interrupting before Izuku had a chance to quiz the gym rat trio about their workout routines, Kirishima asked, So, Midoriya-kun, how was your date with Ishido-san? With a somewhat forced smile. Continuing before Izuku could offer his response, Kirishima added, No, the two of us actually went to the same middle school? She always was one of the popular girls, that Ishido-san. Though he recalled that Kirishima was often shipped with Ishido in his previous life, Izuka's expression was calm as he answered, The cafe we went to was a bust, so we mainly just walked around before parting at the station. Still, it was pretty enjoyable for my first date. We even exchanged numbers near the end. Inserting himself into the conversation, Kaminari jokingly remarked, You don't pull your punches, do you, Midoriya Kuin? It's only the third day of school, and you're already on a first-name basis with half the girls in our class. Save some for the rest of us, man. Shaking his head, Izuko calmly asserted, I haven't really done anything all that special. I mean, I'm sure everyone here can agree that the girls in our class are amazing, right? I just voice my thoughts aloud and treat them like people instead of members of an alien species. You should give it a try. Exhaling a sigh, Kaminari groaned. If only it were that easy. I honestly don't know how you can say half the things you say with a straight face. Whenever I imagine myself trying it, I get literal goosebumps. Seriously, man, you're something else. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku asked, What do you want me to say? Before preempting Kaminari's response by adding, The only reason such thoughts make you cringe is because they're insincere, even in your mind. Once you successfully confess and start dating a girl you like, you'll come to find such words flow like water. As virtually everyone at the table was listening in when Izuka spoke, a peculiar, somewhat pensive atmosphere descended upon the boys of Class 1A. Izuka's claims were more than a little the top, but there was a logic in them that was difficult to refute. There was a reason people said things like, you never truly understand love until you've fallen into it, inadvertently representing the other boys at the table. Ojiro was about to ask Izuka how he came to be so knowledgeable when the school's siren began to blare, followed by a mechanical voice stating, Warning. Security level 3 has been breached. Students, please remain calm and proceed to your designated evacuation zones. I repeat dash, ignoring the automated voice's directions. The students in the cafeteria began stampeding toward the exits as if they were fleeing for their lives. A level 3 breach meant that villains had invaded the campus, so those from the general support and business departments pushed, shoved, and bumped into each other as they fought to be the first to flee. Seeing the frenzied reaction of the other students, tensions among the members of class, one, a increased rapidly, the usually taciturn Tokoyami asking, what should we do, with a bead of sweat somehow forming on his bird-like face. Noticing that quite a few people looked toward him when Tokoyami asked his question, Izuku adopted an assuring smile and replied, what aspiring heroes ought to do before rising to his feet. Fortunately, Yairozu and the other girls were already coming over, so Izuku just waited for them to arrive before asking the former if she could produce a megaphone. Without questioning Izuku's intentions, Yairozu unhesitantly produced a megaphone from her exposed thigh. Upon receiving it, Izuku set the volume to max, climbed atop the lunch table, and brought the mouthpiece to his lips before shouting, Everyone, Please remain calm and mindful of your surroundings. 
There is a high probability this is a false alarm. So stop trying to force your way out and start helping one another. Cooperation is the key to a safe and successful evacuation. Though not everyone listened to Azuka's words, the situation gradually de-escalated when the rest of class 1A joined in. Achiko also got lunch rush. The retired hero, who prepared meals for UA's staff and students, to come over. Once he, a teacher nearly every student respected, took over, the evacuation became a lot smoother. As the rescue training at USJ wouldn't take place until the following day, Izuka got his first taste of a course that wasn't covered in the anime, CPR, first aid, and AED familiarization training. It was a long and exceptionally boring class, but it was necessary since all heroes needed to be CRP and AED certified. Once classes were finally over, Izuku was going to accompany Achiko and Tsuyu to the station, but had to change plans when Principal Nizu once again called him to his office. This time, however, the little mouse bear dog wasn't alone. With him were All Might Aizawa and a teacher in a bulky astronaut-themed costume, Space Hero. 13. Name. Anan Kuroz. Quirk. Black Hole. Current Level. 20. 104,112 EXP. Effective Level. 44. Attribute Strength. 15. Agility. 17. Vitality. 305. Intelligence. 58. Dexterity. 13. Luck. 41. Noticing Izuka's eyes moving as if he was reading something, even if it was only for a brief moment, Niza's smile broadened as he said, I can understand your desire to know more about the people you meet, but it isn't polite to use your quirk on people without their permission. There is no precedent for a quirk like yours in the history of our country, but the laws concerning telepathy and mind reading are likely to apply. Blinking in surprise, Izuka made a mental note to acquire some glasses or goggles for his hero costume as he replied, I'm sorry, Principal Nizu, it's a habit I developed during my efforts to ascertain the value of each of my attributes. I'll be more mindful from now on. Nodding in approval, Niza said, that's all I ask, before shifting topics stating, now on to business. First and foremost, I wanted to commend you for your quick response during the level 3 security breach. Not only did you help de-escalate the situation and guide your fellow students to safety, but according to the report from Lunch Rush, you also assisted in escorting the injured to recovery girl. We're not even halfway through the first week of classes, and you're already well on your way to becoming an exceptional hero. Adopting a smile, Izuku was about to thank Nizu for his praise, but was preempted by All Might shouting. I, too, would like to say a few words. After all, while the parties responsible are ultimately the reporters who stormed the school, this incident wouldn't have occurred if I had held a press briefing and issued an official statement. Following his words, All Might surprised Zuko by bowing nearly 90 degrees and exclaiming, Please forgive me, young Midoriya, and thank you for ensuring no one was seriously injured during today's incident. Feeling more than a little taken aback, by All Might's exceptionally over-the-top response, Izuku found himself at a loss for words. If he could, he would turn around and leave right there and then. Unfortunately, he was stuck enduring the awkward tensions, a wry smile developing across his face as he gradually recovered his senses, scratched his cheek with his right index finger and replied, I was just doing what I ought to do, in a faint, nearly inaudible tone. Hearing Izuku's utterance, the seemingly perpetual smile on All Might's face flashed, like he was in a Colgate commercial. He didn't say anything, but Izuku got the distinct impression he had just moved up on the list of people All Might was considering to succeed him. Inserting himself back into the discussion, Nizu exhaled a soft chuckle, before linking his fingers together and saying, I would now like to move on to the second reason I called you here. Tell me, Midoriya Kuen, do you still have a feeling something bad is about to happen? Assuming Shigaraki had gotten his hands on Class 1, A's itinerary, Izuku didn't hesitate to nod, his expression becoming serious as he revealed. The feeling intensified during lunch, 
and has since grown stronger. I can't predict the exact time or date, but I'm certain an attack will occur in the very near future. Furthermore, considering the timing, I believe it's safe to assume they are targeting All Might or attempting to spite him by harming the students in his care. Listening to Azuka's assertions, the smile on All Might's diminished ever so slightly. He was no stranger to villains targeting and attempting to make a name for themselves by defeating him. He feared not a one of them, but if something were to happen to the students in his care, he would spend the rest of his life enduring the shame. Yet another thing he had considerable experience with, nodding his head in response to Izuka's words, Nizu wore a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes as he said, Thank you for your time, Midori Akuin. Rest easy knowing we will prepare every measure to ensure no harm befalls you or your fellow students. That being said, there is a very high probability I will call upon you in the future. I hope I do not inconvenience you too greatly by doing so. Please perish the thought, replied Izuku. Even if I weren't a student of the Department of Heroics, I would do my utmost to ensure the safety of myself and my fellow students. Yue is as much a symbol of the current era as our greatest heroes. It cannot be allowed to become a battlefield or a place where villains can come and go as they please. Surprised by the severity and conviction of Azuka's statement, a peculiar light flashed across Niza's eyes. He had been the principal of Yue since its transformation to a hero academy more than 40 years prior. He still had a bit of life left in him. But if All Might didn't choose Izuku to succeed him, there was the possibility he could groom the boy as his own. Since a surprising number of individuals have been commenting on the MC's intelligence, I feel compelled to explain things. First of all, intelligence isn't a static attribute that remains fixed from the moment you are born to the moment you die. Not only does it increase as you accumulate knowledge, but your level has a notable impact on it. Bakugo is an excellent example of this, as his intelligence was a mere 7 in spite of the fact that he's fairly intelligent. As for the PhD, holders jokingly referenced by Zuko, most of them are just ordinary civilians. In other words, their intelligence attribute is being gated by the fact they're scrubs. With that said, allow me to explain intelligence more clearly. Simply having a high intelligence attribute does not abruptly make you all-knowing and exceptionally competent in every single subject imaginable. Genius and prodigiousness are things that are cultivated over time, often requiring competent mentors or guidance from similarly intelligent people to truly shine. If a child is born with a quirk that affords them an intelligence attribute of 100, it means very little without adequate knowledge and experience. While the MC does have a background as a soldier, it is specifically mentioned he wasn't the best, just a fairly ordinary grunt who knows how to fire a weapon. Increasing his intelligence wouldn't abruptly turn him into Rambo or someone like John McClane in Die Hard, especially when most of his time was invested in his studies, designing support items and observing stock trends. He may have been training his body but he kept his physical parameters low in order to stockpile free attribute points. Where, exactly, do you expect him to pick up superhuman combat skills and experience fighting robots when he isn't even allowed to use his quirk in public? All of his experience fighting with a superhuman physique came hours before his participation in the UA high entrance exam. This isn't a Marvel or DC movie where the MC has to train to adapt to his powers, while others who receive them are able to master them instantly. In summary, while the MC has a very high intelligence stat, it doesn't make him an omniscient genius who knows everything and can refer to himself as an expert in virtually any field just by memorizing the contents of a dissertation or a textbook. This is especially true concerning things like combat as intelligence has little effect on spatial awareness and reaction time that comes from dexterity. Intelligence is a factor, but there is a reason Einstein wasn't known for his martial arts prowess or strategic brilliance. Though his meeting with Niza didn't last for more than a few minutes, Izuku was still surprised 
to see a seemingly inseparable duo waiting near Yue's front entrance. Waiting until he had reached the duo's side, the smile on Azuka's face broadened as he mused, Hey there, Achiko-san, Tsuchan. Is today my lucky day? Or are the two of you waiting for someone else? Returning a bright but timid smile, Achiko revealed, We actually wanted to apologize for yesterday. We shouldn't have ignored you, even if it was only for a short while. Nodding her head, Tsuyu added, It's my fault, Ribbit. My bachan always told me to be wary of boys who were quick to compliment multiple girls. I thought you might have an ulterior motive, Ribbit. Rubbing the back of his head, Izuku casually admitted, To be fair, that's not far from the truth. It's just that rather than seeking to take advantage of you, I simply want to be your friend. After all, friendship is a foundation atop which many things can be built. Mirroring Nizuka's actions, a sheepish chuckle emanated from Achiko's throat while Tsuyu stared up at him and offered one of her characteristic ribbits. Then, pulling her cell phone out of her pocket, she suggested, If that's the case, we should exchange contact information. I'm not used to using my phone, but I'll respond if you send me a text ribbit. Realizing the true reason Achiko and Tsuyu had waited for him, Izuka's smile broadened as he answered, Of course, I only have three people in my save contact, so I'm happy to have more. Pulling out his phone, Izuku was about to hand it over, but stopped upon noticing he had several text notifications. Oh, I have 13 missed texts from Minasan. Do you mind if I read them real quick? I can also give you my number verbally. That way you can just send me a text, and I can save your information directly. With Tsuyu agreeing to his proposition, Izuku recited his phone number aloud while thumbing through the messages Mina had sent him. The first was her informing him that an ambush awaited him at the front entrance, but the rest concerned his meeting with the principal, asking if he was in trouble and if there was anything she could do to help. How cute! In the midst of reading the texts, Izuku received a text alert from an unknown number. What awaited him when he opened it was a cartoon frog emoji, making it very clear who sent the message. Suppressing the urge to comment on Tsuya's adorable behavior out loud, Izuku quickly typed, Keep this up, and I'll save your phone number under the listing cute frog. Receiving a text notification, Tsuya opened it before becoming statuesque at its contents. A faint blush colored her cheeks, but what surprised Izuku the most was her response, stating, I don't mind, Ribbit. Adopting a broad smile, Izuka thought, It appears our little frog friend is more comfortable with texts than speaking aloud. Before Izuku could type a response, he received a second message from an unknown number. This was obviously from Achiko, but the contents left Izuku a little speechless, as it was a literal wall of text without spaces or punctuation. Seeing the stupefied look on Izuka's face, Achiko held her somewhat dated-looking phone up, as if trying to hide behind it, stammering, Sorry, Izuka Koen. The space key on my phone doesn't work too well, ehehe. <laughs> Contrasting the smartphones carried by Izuku and Tsuyu, Achiko's was a pale ink flip phone. It strangely suited her, but Izuka's expression became serious as he declared, We're getting you a new phone this weekend. If a brand new one is too excessive, I'll upgrade mine to the latest model and give you this one. No buts. Eh. Uh. Failing to process Izuka's words, Achiko's expression blanked for several seconds. When the gears in her mind eventually started turning again, her face became bright red as she waved her hand violently exclaiming, You can't. I mean, I really appreciate the offer, but that's just too much, Izuka Kuen. Shaking his head, Izuku firmly asserted, You will accept it, Achiko-san. If you refuse, I may have to resort to extreme measures. Besides, I still owe you for returning my sword to me. Gifting you a 100,000 yen phone is a pittance compared to the 13 million yen you return to me. Blinking in surprise, Tsuyu questioned, You own a 13 million yen sword? That's surprisingly childish coming from you, Izuka-chan. Unable to suppress the urge to defend himself, Izuka revealed, before enrolling in the Department of Heroes, I seriously considered joining the support or business departments. 
I have a knack for managing finances and modifying the patents for support items. I can't tell you exactly how much I earn, but it's enough that I could retire right now and not have to worry about the future. That's the benefit of having a quirk that enhances brain power. While Achiko had, once again, become statuesque, Tsuyu brought her finger up to her lips and remarked, If that's the case, I think I'm starting to understand why you're so different from the other boys in class. You've already secured your future, while the rest of us are just starting to figure things out, Ribbit. Adopting a somewhat proud smile, Izuku explained, Just as friendship is the foundation for all kinds of relationships, financial security is the trunk from which countless paths branch. And that's why, surprising Achiko immensely, Izuka pointed directly at her face as he appended, You must accept the phone I give you. If you don't, I won't be able to restrain my curiosity. I'll uncover the reason you're unable to acquire one on your own, and then do everything in my power to remedy it. That's my kind of plus ultra. Though his words and actions were more than a little excessive, the truth of the matter was that Izuku felt obligated to ensure the safety and well-being of those related to the canon plot. He didn't consider himself a truly selfless person, but if he ignored the consequences of his obfuscation of fate, he would do more harm to this world than good. That was one of the reasons Izuku joined the hero course. If the students of class 1A died, while he was fooling around in the support or business departments, he would likely spend the rest of his life regretting it. With Achiko eventually agreeing to accept his old phone, the trio made their way to the station, hanging out for a bit before parting ways when the sky began to darken. During the train ride and subsequent walk home, Izuka's phone was practically blowing up with texts from Mina and Tsuyu. The latter was surprisingly talkative when she didn't have to speak aloud, so Izuka ultimately invited her, Achiko, and Mina to a group chat before shifting his focus elsewhere. Assuming the USJ incident would wrap up fairly quickly, with All Might still in possession of One for All, Izuku flipped open the journal, recording his progress and detailing his plans for the future. All Might appearing as one of the teachers of class 1A had derailed things quite a bit, but not to the extent he had to rework everything. Though his chances were slim, especially with Todoroki in the running, Izuku was determined to secure first place in the UA Sports Festival. Not because he cared about being number one, but because he was trying to earn the attention of a certain bunny girl. By focusing his combat style around speed and kicking power, Izuku was hoping to catch the attention of Mirko, the hero billboard chart's eighth-ranked hero. There were three reasons for this. First and foremost, Mirko was incredibly hot. Secondly, she was one of the few pros that didn't own or belong to a hero agency. In other words, by interning under her, Izuka believed he would have greater freedom than most other interns. While the reasons above were both important, it was his belief that Mirko would make an excellent coach and training partner that compelled Izuku to apprentice slash intern under her. He might have to suffer a bit, but having an attractive and exceptionally fierce teacher would motivate him to improve a hell of a lot faster than if he trained under someone like All Might. Not to mention that, much like Mirko, Izuku was determined to live a life without regrets. As the vice class representative of Class 1A, Izuku was expected to show up much earlier than the other students. Fortunately, he wasn't the only one as Yairozu Tokoyami and Siro were also present the latter two on morning duty. Spotting Izuka the moment he entered the classroom, Yairozu rose to her feet, smiling as she said, Good morning, Midoriya Kuen. Were you able to sleep well last night? I personally experienced some difficulty. I kept replaying the incident that transpired during lunch in my mind, plagued by the notion I could have handled things better. By the time she was finished speaking, Yairozu's smile had faded quite a bit, replaced by a pensive and slightly downcast expression. She had a very pronounced sense of responsibility, so she was currently questioning her status as the class representative since Izuku was the one who took charge, both during and after the incident, adopting a friendly and reassuring smile. Izuku calmly asserted, You're too hard on yourself, 
Yairoza-san. However, the notion that we could have handled things better is correct. Fortunately, we have three years to learn. After all, the main purpose of the Hero Course is to teach us how to assess, handle, and resolve situations as efficiently as possible. Expecting perfection before you've even become a pro is insensible. Though she was momentarily taken aback by Izuka's response, a smile invariably found its way to Yairoza's face as she replied, You're right, of course. I guess I just got a little ahead of myself. Thanks for opening my eyes, Midoriya Kun. I greatly appreciate it. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, While I appreciate your gratitude, it's unwarranted. After all, didn't we promise on the first day to look after and inform each other if there was something we could do to improve? I'm just keeping my end of the bargain. To that end, if you witness me making any mistakes, I expect you to do the same. Recalling that they had, in fact, made such a promise, the faint smile on Yairoz's face blossomed. Her words during their initial meeting were primarily intended as pleasantries, so it was strangely refreshing to learn that Izuku regarded the exchange with such consideration. It was difficult to describe, but it made her feel uniquely floaty. With the first half of the day passing surprisingly quickly, Izuku was on tenor hooks as he awaited Aizawa's arrival and the announcement they would be conducting rescue training at USJ. Fortunately, just as Siro was about to ask why he was so nervous, the door to the classroom slid open with a distinct vigor, followed by a familiar voice exclaiming, I am here, seeing all might appear in place of Aizawa. Relief washed over Izuku like a warm shower. In the canon, Aizawa was the one to inform them of their foundational heroics training. All Might had overexerted himself, rescuing people on his way to school, so he was in the midst of recuperating when Class 1A set out for USJ. Now, either as a result of Azuka's warning or the fact that All Might had yet to pass on one for all, the undisputed number one hero would be participating from the very beginning. After changing into their hero costumes, the students of Class 1A boarded a large shuttle that would ferry them to their destination, the unforeseen simulation joint USJ. Though he was secretly worried that shit would hit the fan, Izuka forced himself to appear calm, a carefree smile adorning his face despite being seated between Tsuyu and Achiko. Fortunately, though Mina didn't hesitate to comment on their seating arrangement, the trip between UA and USJ didn't even last five minutes. Izuku would have preferred it to have taken five hours, but that was the thing about time. The more you wish you had, the sooner it ran out. Once everyone had disembarked the bus, All Might raised his hands high, seemingly supporting the massive, dome-like structure behind him as he shouted. Welcome, students of Class 1A, to USJ. Though most of them had no idea of the building's significance, everyone but Izuku, Shinso, and Tokoyami clapped in response to All Might's words. During this, Aizawa emerged from the building's entrance, his expression a languorous deadpan as he said, Give it a rest and get inside. This isn't a fan meeting or a book signing. You're here to train. With Aizawa's words as a catalyst, Class 1A made their way inside USJ's dome, a massive, incredibly spacious structure encompassing more than a hundred acres. The inside, fitting the name, Unforeseen Situation Joint, was divided into eight sections, six of which simulated the many disasters heroes faced in the execution of their duties. This included a ruined urban environment, a sloped terrain simulating a landslide, a mountainous region with fragile cliffs, a mock city that was perpetually set ablaze, a maritime environment with a lake, ship, and even a water slide, and a zone that was beset by hurricane force winds and a torrential downpour. Waiting for the students to arrive, standing 180 centimeters and wearing her bulky, astronaut-themed outfit, was Space Hero 13. Seeing her caused Achiko to geek out for a moment, but Izuka couldn't really blame her. If he could pick and choose a quirk, 13's definitely would have made the list. It had many weaknesses. But the ability to create black holes at the tips of your fingers 
was an exceptionally powerful ability, using a voice synthesizer that made it difficult to tell if she was a man or a woman. Thirteen took a moment to clear her throat before spreading her arms and declaring, I've been waiting for you. Welcome, students of Class 1A, to the unforeseen situation joint. As all might had already welcomed them mere moments prior, the smiles on the faces of Class 1A became noticeably cramped. Fortunately, things didn't become too tense as all might took the initiative to initiate another round of applause, laughing spiritedly as he did so, unaware that she, or more accurately, all might had stolen her thunder. Thirteen went on to explain the purpose of USJ before beginning a short lecture about the nature of quirks and their capacity to cause harm. Her words were especially meaningful to Shinso, as toward the end, Thirteen firmly reinforced the notion that quirks were not evil, so long as they were wielded responsibly, even the most dubious or innately destructive quirks could be used to help people. With Thirteen's lecture coming to an end, Izuka tensed in preparation for what was to come. As a result, he was left feeling confused when Aizawa said, Now that that's out of the way, everyone split up into groups of five. We'll determine which zone you'll go to after that. While Izuka's mind was drawing a blank Achiko to you, and somewhat surprisingly, Shinso made their way over to him. Upon seeing the look on his face, Tsuyu tilted her head to the side, touching her bottom lip as she remarked, is everything okay, Azukakin? You look like you've just seen a ghost, Ribbit. Blinking back to awareness, Izuku replied, Sorry, Tsuyu-chan. I was just so inspired by 13's speech that I dashed before Izuku could finish a sentence. All Might bellowed. Students, gather together and be on your guard. Aizawa, 13, protect them. Accompanying All Might's shout, a hazy black vortex opened near the fountain representing USJ's center. Its appearance momentarily caused Izuku to feel a sense of relief, but that changed drastically when the first figure emerged from the portal, bringing with him a bloodlust that spread outward like a frigid eruption. Name, Tenko Shimura. Quirk, Decay Vestige, Preservation Vestige, Self-Immolation Vestige. Current Level, 41. Author's note, henceforth, only going to include this for the MC. Effective level, 584. Attributes strength, 76. Agility, 83. Vitality, 4928. Intelligence, 41. Dexterity, 118. Luck, 603. With a slim frame, grayish blue hair, and a body covered in the embalmed hands of his former family and victims. Anyone familiar with the Boku no Hero Academia universe would recognize the man that had emerged from the gate as Tamura Shigaraki. What surprised Izuku, other than Tamura's intense bloodlust, was his ridiculous vitality, luck, and effective level. He had expected Tamura to be fairly weak, but the man was already leagues above ordinary heroes. Shifting his gaze to Tamura's quirks, Izuka's eyes widened as information about them filled his mind. Decay, as the name implied, allowed Tamura to decay whatever he touched with his five fingers. As for preservation and self-immolation, the former allowed his body to adapt and survive almost anything, while the latter was a self-destruct quirk that would cause him to combust spontaneously. More importantly, all three of his quirks were vestiges, fragments of someone else's quirk that had been transplanted in his body. Though countless questions filled his mind when seeing Tamura's status, Izuku shifted his gaze to the other two threats within the group emerging from the Vortex. A man comprised of the same hazy black substance as the Vortex, and a black-skinned behemoth with a muscular body, beak-like mouth, large eyes, and exposed brain. Nem Oboroshirikuno Quirk Cloud Cellular Deconstruction Vestige Spatial Link Vestige Current Level 27 Effective Level 82 Attributes Strength 21 Agility 39 Vitality 611 Intelligence 59 Dexterity 50 Luck 44 
Name. Masahiko Takamura. Quirk. Shock Absorption, Super Regeneration Vestige. Energy Conversion Vestige. Adamantite Bones Vestige. Current Level. 105. Effective Level. 3887. Attributes Strength. 14311. Agility. 4920. Vitality. 17077. Intelligence. 5. Dexterity. 2558. Luck. 3. Seeing the stats of Masahiko Takamura. Better known within the Boku no Hero Academia community as the USJ Nomo. Izuka felt a combination of fear, confusion, and relief. The muscle-bound monstrosity could swat him like a fly if ordered to do so, but as long as All Might was around, the only thing Izuka feared was getting dust in his eye from the shockwaves. After all, as terrifying as level 3887 was, it was a far cry from All Might's 60k+. Plus. Name, Tashinori Yagi, Quirk, Transfer, Stockpiling, Singularity, Gear Shift, Sealed, F.A. Gene Sealed, Danger Sense Sealed, Black Whip Sealed, Smoke Screen Sealed, Float Sealed. Current Level 20,108 1,094,564,432,080 XP Effective Level 60,344 Attribute Strength 219,004 Agility 53,964 Vitality 298,408 Intelligence 69 Dexterity 31,896 Luck 108 Though he had the distinct impression that All Might had gotten a little weaker, Izuku wasn't too concerned. Even if All Might's effective level decreased by half, he was nearly eight times stronger than the Nomo. If not for the latter's shock absorption and super regeneration, it wouldn't even be a contest. Demonstrating this fact, All Might entrusted the students of class when, uh, to Aizawa and Thirteen, before leaping into the fray with such speed that he appeared to vanish into thin air. A moment later, tens of villains crumpled like marionettes with their strings cut as All Might shouted, you villains! Did you honestly believe you could just waltz into UA when I am here? Without waiting for a response, All Might sent several additional villains flying before charging toward who he believed to be the ringleader of the assault, Tamira and his pet Nomo. Surprised by All Might's speed, Tamira barely had enough time to shout, Get him, Noma! before the former's fist appeared before him, crushing the hand covering his face and sending the lanky man flying. Before All Might could follow up and try to capture Tamira, the Nomo opened its beak-like mouth, revealing razor-sharp teeth as it blitzed him with extreme speed. All Might had no trouble reacting to it, but he was a little surprised as not many people, villain or otherwise, could force him to defend. Sliding back from the force of the Noma's blow, All Might's smile seemed to sparkle as he said, You're pretty strong. Fortunately for the people of this glorious nation, nay, the entire world, it'll take a lot more than that to defeat the symbol of peace. Setting aside the existence of Tamira, at least for the time being, All Might charged to meet the Noma head-on, their fists creating phantom images as powerful shockwaves rippled through the area, vaporizing the water in the fountain, uprooting nearby trees, and sending the bodies of several unfortunate villains both conscious and not flying. Amid the borderline cataclysmic exchange, All Might's smile gradually faded at the realization his punches had little to no effect on the Nomo. The same applied in reverse, but All Might was used to tanking damage without receiving so much as a scratch. I'm glad the principal heeded young Midoriya's advice, thought All Might. If this creature had been unleashed in my absence, I can't even begin to imagine the devastation it would wreak. Punctuating his thoughts, All Might reared back his right fist, gathering a fair amount of his stockpiled energy as he roared, Detroit Smaz! Following through with his punch, All Might's fist impacted the Noma's abdomen before he twisted his wrist and spiked the muscular creature into the ground, 
creating a massive crater and a colossal dust explosion that reached the reinforced glass panels of USJ's dome. When the dust settled several seconds later, the Noma was sprawled out in the center of the crater. Its eyes popped out and a gaping hole in its abdomen, furrowing his brows. All Might was thankful none of the students were close enough to witness the rather gruesome scene. One of the woeful truths of being a hero was that not every villain could be defeated and detained without seriously injuring or even killing them. Most heroes did their best to avoid such an outcome, but there were times when it simply couldn't be helped. Exhaling a sigh, All Might turned away from the Nomo, intending to take out the remaining villains and capture Tamira. When he never expected was to find a swirling vortex mere centimeters away from his face, from within which emerged a dry, exceptionally pale hand. Though he ordinarily wouldn't fear even a small-yield nuclear warhead, All Might's instinct screamed at him to evade the gangly hand at all costs. Fortunately, while he was caught unawares, his reaction speed was such that he could even dodge lasers if he noticed them before they fired. For a brief moment, it even seemed like the world around him had stopped, allowing him to get a good look at the crazed youth staring at him through the portal. Such malice. How could such a young man harbor such intense hatred? What kind of life must he have endured? Instead of asking these questions aloud, All Might dodged Tamira's hand and shouted, You scoundrel! Attempting to sneak an attack in while I was distracted? I think not. Trusting his instincts, All Might didn't attempt to grasp Tamira's hand and yank him from the shadowy vortex. Instead, he thrust forward with his palm, creating a pressurized column of air that impacted Tamira's chest, sending him flying back through the portal and revealing his location on the opposite side of the fountain. So, that's where you're hiding! shouted All Might, his figure flickering before reappearing at the location revealed by his previous attack. There, a moderately injured Tamira was being cradled by his shadowy, portal-creating companion, Kurojiri. Stopping All Might in his tracks, Tamira groaned, This isn't what Master said, before abruptly rising to a seated position and shouting, You're not supposed to be this strong! Furrowing his brows, All Might asked, Throwing a tantrum after you've lost? You really are a child. Gritting his teeth hard enough that his gums were bleeding, it was clear that Tamira wanted to argue. Instead, the bloodlust exuding from his body became even more potent as he threatened. Things won't end the same way the next time we meet. I'll destroy you and tear down this false society you've created. Just wait. Following Tamira's declaration, Kurajai reactivated his warp gate with the intention of escaping. The moment he did so, All Might shouted, as if I'd let you, while charging forward. Tamira smiled menacingly in response, but his expression quickly changed when Kurajiri's warp abruptly ceased, courtesy of Aizawa, better known within the hero and villain communities as Racerhead, due to his power to negate other quirks. The only place you're going is jail, shouted All Might, slamming his fist into Tamira's face with enough force to both knock him out and send him skidding across the landscape with Kurajiri. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.